Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board meeting will now come to order. As a result of the COVID-19 virus, the Planning Board will conduct the meeting via remote access as provided by Maine law. The Planning Board will use Zoom meeting to conduct the meeting and to allow the public to remotely attend and participate. Zoom will allow all Planning Board members, applicants, and members of the public to hear all discussion and hear votes, which will be taken by roll call as required by law. Um, so first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Does anyone have any comments, questions, or corrections on the minutes? Good, do I have a motion? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. Oh, yeah. Maureen, a couple seconds. please take a roll call. So I heard the motion by Mr. Sarbeck and it was seconded by whom? I did oh, it. I might have at the same time. I don't know. Jim. Not, Jim. 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 Oh, it Jim. Give it a Jim. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Pierre Shalott. Yes. Okay, moving on. Next item on the agenda is short-term rental amendments. The town council has referred for the planning board to review proposed short-term rental amendments and a revision to recommendation number 86 of the 2019 comprehensive plan, section 19.10.3 amendments to, uh, sorry, tax section 19.10.3. Um, because of the length of uh, the number of items on our agenda uh, this evening, the planning board thought it prudent to table uh, this item to a future meeting. Um, however, we do uh, we will open up the planning board to public comment on the item of short-term rentals. Uh, if anyone wishes to speak on it, I would um simply remind everybody that we will be having the actual meeting on the short-term rentals in the future and your time would probably be better spent commenting on short-term rental issues at that time maureen do we have anybody uh teed up to speak on short on this item yes we have one person whose hand is raised okay um can you go ahead and uh, allow them to speak, please? Yeah. And we need to hear the name and the address. Hi, hey. everyone. Zeb Myrowitz, 14 Hill, uh, 12 Hill Way, uh, Cape Elizabeth. Uh, everyone Joe, knows who I am. This? I'm sorry? Joe, do you want me to time this? No, it won't take that long, Maureen. Joe? Yes. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Zev. Okay, so I just want to make sure um, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time reviewing um, the meeting notes, and I, it's really more a question for uh, the planning board in regards to the last section. Um, in, in regards to the town center zoning specifically, it appears that the um, language that the um, planning board agreed upon during the previous meeting, and I understand this is fluid, I, I'm not, I understand that you know, it's a topic of discussion. Um, I just want to make sure that the, the comments that I saw from the town's attorney on general recommendations, I wanted to seek clarification on, on whether or not the planning board had discussed or reevaluated specifically how they were going to classify short-term rentals for the town center zone. Okay, thank you. Maureen, are there any other people with their hands up wishing to speak? No one else. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, there is someone. Um, and he's been allowed to talk. D. Losher. For sure, I think. Oh. Hi. Yes. Hi, this is Dan Lashur. I live at 11 Hill Way. The, uh, and I just wanted to bring you people up to speed exactly what's going on. The, uh, 
the town right of way may not be where you think it is. In 1992, I notified the town. Excuse me, is this in really? Excuse me, Dan. Is this in relation to the short-term rental question, or is it pertaining to? Sounds like it's pertaining to one of the items on the agenda. Okay, I may have I may have jumped in a little soon. I got in a little late. Yes, we're not on 14 Hill Way yeah. yet. Okay. Yep. Well, you yeah. can, okay, you have, I apologize and I'm sorry. Not a problem. Um, Joe. Okay. Um, John. Well, when public, it, is public comment over? Sorry, I jumped the gun there. Um, so we so have, are there any other hands up, Maureen? I don't Dr. see. Dr. Meyerowitz has his hand up. I don't know if it's just a leftover and it's a leftover. Okay. Okay. All right, so the public comment session is closed now. Um, Jonathan. So I just wanted to make sure that it was aware that um, Dr. Meyerowitz did reach out to me uh, probably about a month and a half ago indicating um, he called, left a message. I called him back as a courtesy uh, and he said that it wasn't about his application, but he did want to talk about the short term rentals. So I indicated to him that I couldn't talk to him about the short term rentals that any comments that he had um, needed to go toward uh, to Maureen so it could be shared with the whole planning board. And I believe a few days later, he sent that letter to us with regards to his thoughts on the short-term rental um, proposals. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Um, but there was nothing that was discussed uh, in substance between the two of us with regards to it once I told him that we couldn't talk about it. And I also contacted by Zev um, on or I think October 6th or 7th, I don't remember which. And I did not, via email, I did not respond. I, and I forwarded the email to Maureen and she took it from there. So we, we did not, I did not reply. So there was no substantive discussion. Okay. Um, this time I'm not prepared to have any discussion regarding the short-term rental item. Does anybody wish to uh, make a motion to table it to the next. Uh, we I have will. actually a date. I will. One more. Okay. You ready? Go ahead. Yep. Be it ordered that based on the draft materials and the facts presented, the short term rental amendments and compre comprehensive plan amendment to recommendation number 86 are tabled to the regular November 17, 2020 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Do we have a second? Second. Discussion? Okay, Maureen, can you take a vote? Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Yes. Curry. Mr. Curry? Yes. Uh, Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Dear Shalott? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, the next item on the agenda, 14 Hill Way. Two Penguin Properties LLC is requesting site plan review of mixed use building with 1,920 square feet for use of short term rental on the ground floor and one residential unit on the main and second floor. And an amendment to the Tarbox Triangle subdivision located at 14 Hill Way. The application was deemed complete September 15, 2020, and a public hearing has been scheduled for this evening. The plan will be reviewed under section 1623 of the subdivision ordinance, um, section 199 site plan regulations, and section 1964 town center design requirements. So if I could get the applicant to summarize any changes made to the plan since the last meeting. Um, and uh, who's going to be speaking? Is it Rick? Hi, all. I, I Hi, Rick. I got booted off and then missed that last bit while it was reloading. <clears throat> oh, okay. Well, you're going to summarize any changes made to the plan since the last meeting. 
Yes, thank you. So for the record, Rick Dutton with Mainland Development Consultants representing uh, two penguin properties on 14 Hill Way. Uh, Dr. Zev Majorowicz is also uh, on, on here, the applicant for the project. Uh, uh, changes since the last sub submittal uh, are technical in nature and uh, basically intended to address the town engineer's comments um, with some some remaining items, including some drainage, uh, a few utility items, uh, as well as uh, uh, some easements. Okay, is there anything we need to look at? I can I, make him the host so he can share the plans. You wanna show us anything on the plans? So I, I find these terribly interesting. I don't know that anyone else does. <laughs> They're, they're, they're pretty much engineer to engineer. I mean, I, I can go down through, we, we summarize the comments in a, in a submittal letter, uh, plan by plan. And if that's helpful, I can do that. But it was, um, you know, I would say nothing substantive changed in relation to uh, what's been talked about with the board in the past, as well as uh, uh, what you All guys- All right, let me just pull the board. Is there any board members? Is, are there any, <clears throat> any drawings in particular or any items? you wish to have Rick uh, speak on? I just, I just have a question. The engineer's letter is dated October 14th. And the letter from Rick as part of the submission is dated October 1st. What's the difference? Was there anything additional in the October 14th letter that we need to talk about that you didn't address in your submission letter? Yeah, so this this process requires that we submit um, in advance of the meeting, uh, well, and following that, following that engineers uh, the engineers comments and the staff review comes through. Um, I think there were there were uh, potentially a couple uh, uh, a couple small items that uh, that Maureen's noted in the staff memo uh, that okay. that might be addressed as. Um, uh, potential cleanup items if the board were inclined uh, as conditions of uh, conditional approval if we were to get to that point. Okay. okay, anything else? Okay, in that case, we will open up the uh, meeting to public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to make a public comment regarding this application? So Joe, I need um, Rick to make me the host again so that I can recognize oh, people. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you. And this is uh, an official public hearing, not just general public comment. Oh, thank you. Want to state that? Maureen, would you mind helping me on that again? How do I how do I get that back? To the you? list of participants. So if you hover in the bottom of the screen, you'll see participants, and you click on that and then go over uh, to the panelist list. And I think if you click on my name under more, you can make me host. Perfect, thank you. All right, so there are 16 attendees right now and at least one of them has their hand up. So I'm okay. gonna- Let's recognize uh, Lejeur. Yes, hello, good evening, folks. The, uh, Dan Lejeur, I live at 11 Hill Way here in the great town of Cape Elizabeth. The uh, may have been in construction years. The uh, one of my small projects is 25 million down here in Danbury, Connecticut. The, uh, some of my, the right of way. As of right now, the town does not have legal right to that right of way. The, uh, it's been an ongoing since 1992 that was resolved until a couple of years ago with the Hillway reconstruction. The town had agreed to purchase that land for me. And now all of a sudden they're turning tail on that and telling me otherwise. The um, 
which brings up more problems because you've issued building permits based upon my survey that you agreed with. And now you're taking that back. So now you issue building permits on substandard lots. The, uh, I don't know if you're privy to any of this, but I'd love to talk to any of you at a workshop. Now, as for the building itself, the, uh, if you look at it, it's going to be in a hole. It is not a first floor. If it's a first floor, that's where the measurement on height needs to take place, pursuant to IBC, the, uh, because it's a flat, flat and level lot to begin with. You will not be able to see this commercial space driving either on Hillway or Scott Dyer. One, it's in a hole. Number two, the plantings around it, you will not be able to see it, which affect the windows. It needs 50% windows. The, uh, you're not gonna get 50% of what you think it's gonna be. You're not going to see them, plain and simple. The, uh, the drainage, the drainage goes through the public right of way the, uh, for quite some distance. It also sheds out onto the impermeable, uh, the proverbial uh, blacktop that's supposed to shed the water in lieu of storm drains and whatnot. There, and there's quite a maintenance to those. And if they're not maintained, they do nothing. And the water sheds out through over the top and does what it wants like water does. The, uh, the basement, just to give an example on the bowl, the basement ceiling height on the architectural prints is 10 feet to finish ceiling. How are you gonna achieve that the, uh, without blowing the height? Number two, the, uh, it, it's just impossible. Thing that I'm not understanding. Yeah, yeah I can, you're I breaking up that. really badly here. Yeah, and your time is up. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank yeah. you for your Hopefully comment. you caught some of that. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Maureen, I see Mike Friedland has his hand up. Yep. Okay, I'm going to have to promote Mike to panelists because he can't speak as an attendee because his version of Zoom is old. Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Just barely. Uh, hi, Mike Friedland, 287 Ocean House Road. Um, I'll be short and quick. I am just, uh, I'm very much supportive of the project of Zev and Amber Meyerwitz and they've been great neighbors. Um, their existing project I feel is a fantastic addition to the town of Cape. Um, I feel like they followed through on everything they've said they're going to do. They do their due diligence. Um, they do a great job. They work hard. And uh, as their neighbor, I am just completely in support of their project. And uh, I've checked it over, and it looks great. I think it's going to be a great addition to the area. And uh, yeah, I, I wish them well. OK, it. thank you. All right. Maureen, I see no other hands up. View. Uh, if I could just check. Um. Oh, Mark Booten just yes. raised his hand. Okay. Bouton Booten. He's allowed okay. to speak. Mark, go ahead. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Me? Hi, everyone. Uh, Mark Booten, uh, for Greenview Drive in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I would also like to voice my support for Amber and Zev's uh, project at 14 Hill Way. Um, I've known Amber and Zev for many years, been neighbors with them for a long time. Um, 
and I have the utmost respect for them. And I think that they are uh, wonderful neighbors and residents in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I know that they work the ordinances and everything that needs to be done to the T. Um, so I would love to be able to see this project come to fruition. Um, and I would just want to voice my utmost uh, support for this project and hope everybody can um, support them as well. So thank you for your time and um, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, anybody else out there wants to speak? Time to raise your hand. Oh, Brianna Booten. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi, I'm not sure if my video is working, but if you can hear me, that's sufficient. Um, so I also wanted to voice some support for this project. Um, I have personally known the Merowitz for, goodness, uh, many years now. Um, originally they were our neighbors. Um, we have, my husband Mark and I have just come to um, incredibly respect and admire their commitment to the community. Um, it was, you know, forefront in their mind when they moved here. Um, they have dedicated so much time, so much money and their careers um, to the town, to serving the people of the town. Um, their plan has been meticulous, um, meticulously executed um, from the very start. Um, they're diligent, thorough. Um, they've definitely done their homework um, in every area before taking on any project. Um, I spoke to some of the details of, of some of the barriers in an email that I sent um, in support of this, so I don't feel like I need to go over that again. Um, but just as a resident of um, Cape Elizabeth, I've found it really disheartening um, to learn about some of the pushback that's happening. Um, and I think that um, everything that they've contributed to the community is, you know, being over overlooked um, and them not being able to um, fulfill this, this project um, for their home. So that's my, that's my piece that I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Um, I do not see anyone else. Does anyone else out there wish to speak? Okay, seeing none, I'm closing the public hearing. Um, does anybody uh, wish to make any comments? Andrew? Um, I just had a question about, there was one comment from um, that about the building height issue and I know there's a we have a maximum building height of 35 feet and there there was some discussion in the past about how building height is measured and that's gotten that's been in conflict so I just wanted to hear from Maureen that um, this is not an issue you know he was suggesting IBC which what building international building codes that because it's sunk below the grade that it's that this isn't going to come up to be an issue later yes yeah, so um the portion when the, the short answer is that i asked the code enforcement officer to review the application submitted by the applicant and he confirmed that the proposed building is a little below the maximum height limit so there's like two and a half feet uh, below the maximum 35 foot height limit and one of the reasons it is, is because you measure from average original grade. So when someone proposes a building that is below grade, uh, then you're gonna be able to um, accommodate that extra space. But it, the short answer is there, is there is an email in writing from the code officer that this meets the height requirements. Thank you. You're welcome. Carol Ann. Maureen. Uh, can you address this right of way issue that Ms. Lejeur talked about with the town and how it may or may not impact this particular item? Well, yes. And I think uh, there's, there's two different right of ways working. And unfortunately, it's still a bit of an outstanding issue with this application. 
but uh, when the project in between the last time you saw it in a workshop and before it was submitted for a formal meeting, uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth, not me, uh, decided to have some research done on the right of way of Hill Way. Now, when it was, uh, when the board reviewed the original Hill Way project, an assumption was made that the right of way was 50 feet wide. Um, however, when the research was done in June of this year, uh, the firm of Monaghan Leahy determined that when the section of Route 77 moved off of Hill Way and onto the new section, the 66 foot wide existing right of way was never changed. And for that reason, it appears that the right of way on Hill Way is 66 feet wide and not 50 feet wide. When Dr. Meyerwitz had his original subdivision approved, we assumed it was 50 feet wide. Subsequent to the July to the June determination by the town attorney's office, there was an additional determination in July of this year. And that determination was that the right of way of Hillway is from the center line um, 25 feet or 50 feet heading east towards uh, the Meyerwitz property and 66 feet or 33 feet from the center line towards the Leisure property. So that's where the town has landed on that at this time. Um, you know, if anything, the town has a lot of right of way there, not too little. The, the outstanding issue, however, if you look at um, the plans for this project, it shows both rights of way. The 14 Hill Way project is actually assuming a 66 foot wide right of way and the subdivision lots are at a 50 foot wide right of way. And since you asked the question, I'm gonna take this opportunity to bring it up because it, it relates to the drainage easements. Um, and the town is saying that because there seems to be some inconsistency in how it's being represented on the current plans, we really do need to have those drainage easements because either most of the drainage is in the right of way or at least a little bit is in the right of way. May I comment on that as well? Hold on, any other member of the board want to ask a question about this? Jonathan. Well, just to follow up. So Maureen, what would it take to get those drainage easements? Um, the applicant needs to provide a documented easement. It's, it's a written document, it says drainage easement, usually has a meets and bounds description or some reference to a plan. And um, those easements would need to be submitted to the town attorney, he would review them. Uh, we'd come to an agreement on language and the applicant would sign them. So those are proposed as conditions of approval on this project. Yeah, okay. That sounds good. That sounds like our typical type of uh, approval items. Um, Deb, did you want to shed light on that? Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, just to follow up on Maureen's comments, once we learned of the discrepancy with the right of way, this did delay us a month in planning board just because the town was doing its due diligence on that process. We had the option of removing of moving our building and the additional eight feet uh, easterly to avoid the issue altogether, um, which we chose to do so. So under all right of way circumstances, our building setbacks do conform. Um, we've already submitted language to um, our attorneys over at uh, Drummond Woodsum uh, drafting the uh, mutual easement language, um, making sure that uh, you know, we, have, we have no issues with an approval contingent to that. Okay. Um, so that's a non, non-issue on our end. All right, does anybody have any other items they wish to discuss on this? Oh, hey, Joe, damp this down. Uh, um, no, real quick question on um, the engineer's report, page three. This is a question to the applicant's engineer. Just really quickly, uh, are they gonna be submitting the stormwater management report and calculations? It's the last comment on STI's letter. Rick? Bear with me just a minute while I pull that up. It's on page three, the, the very last comment.
about the inspection and maintenance plan. Is that what you're asking about? I uh, know it's the it's number one underneath stormwater okay. comments. Um, and because this was, you know, a letter written in October 14th, I just thought I would ask the question. Yeah, so um, <laughs> where this comment has to do with a little bit of a, a agree to disagree kind of moment between engineers. Um, we've got a we've got a main DEP standard uh, for for a way to model um, uh, storage within a filter pond, and uh, and so the main DEP uh, BMP manual gives a guidance that you you uh, model the the top six inches as 100% void in lieu of uh, uh, in lieu of determining the void space within the full filter area um, as a percentage. And so it's just, a, it's an easier way to model that within the, within the somewhat modeling program that we use. And uh, uh, so Steve's comment is, is basically indicating that he's uh, either disagreeing or not understanding <clears throat> the, uh, the um, basis for the, the six inches of additional storage because uh, it, it appears to be below the top of the of the filter pond. So hooray, engineering stuff. Um, it's it's um, so so. Will your design work? Yeah. Okay. All right. Another way to describe that is what what uh, mainland is using is a standard main calculation for their watershed. Okay. And and by that definition, it meets. That's fine. Thank you. Jonathan. Just one thing to clarify. Um, I don't personally have a problem with it, but just because the public comment was made, I just want to make sure that we address it, um, was that there was something brought up about 50% windows, um, which I think is already in the design. Um, and that doesn't have to do with the trees uh, that go around the property and that we did look into uh, the issue with regards to what was brought out about this being dug out um, and the ground floor being the first floor uh, being below grade. But uh, can we just verify that the 50% uh, the um, requirement is met? That requirement is met. Okay. Is that, that's shown somewhere, right, on a drawing? Yeah. It's on the submission plans. It was an issue of conjecture a few months ago. We made sure that we added the appropriate windows and doors to make sure we met that standard. Uh, the calculation was provided by the architect. Thank you. Yep. And Joe? Yeah? I think further to that was, was also sort of the comment that because there were so many plantings that it would essentially hide the windows, but that there's, as far as I know, nothing in the ordinance saying that they can't be obscured in that way. So that probably just needs to be clear. Okay. I mean, are you, are you, I, I think we're question there. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just saying that I, I, I think that's, it's fine that there's plantings and that just means you're not going to, I mean, like any house, you, you're not going to see the whole house if you have plantings there, but it doesn't mean that the windows don't exist and it doesn't meet some sort of standard. So that's all I was getting at. Yeah. I can't buffer while not buffering. All right, any other comments? Would anyone like to make a motion? Jim. <laughs> oh, I have a question, I'm sorry, I forgot. It's okay, go ahead. Does, does the driveway width need to be wavered or is it uh, just it is what it is kind of thing? Question, I guess, for Maureen. Maureen. There is no specified width, so you don't need okay. to wave it. All right. Uh, Maureen, looks like Peter got kicked out and he's hanging out in the panelists or the attendee. Uh, well, thank you. He said his hand raised. Well, oh, maybe Peter may have a comment. Okay, hold on, Jim. <laughs> Thank you for noticing that, Andrew. Yeah, you just need to unmute yourself. I 
wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Peter, he's, unmute yourself. There you go. You're still on mute. Uh -huh, okay. Did you have any any comments or questions? I do have a question. And were you calling for a resolution on the application itself? Or, or are we not there yet? Or, or is there an opportunity to comment on other aspects of the Yes. No, I'm calling. Well, I was calling for any comments or questions about the application. Okay. And I have one, none, so go ahead. I have two questions. One, um, in the, and I, I know we're not talking about the short term amendment. Um, ordinance, but as it now reads, it talks about this as an accessory use. And I wanted to ask Maureen how that squared with the advice letter, which we've gotten from uh, the outside council. And number two, I, the one thing uh, I still bothers me about this is the staircase connection between the basement commercial property and the residential space above. Uh, to me, that's in inconsistent with the two, the separation of functions that's in Congress. And I would uh, propose to my colleagues that we require that that uh, stair connection be taken out and not permitted. Uh, I, I see no, no reason other than it's going to serve the basement use as a guest suite for the main house. Okay, so do you want me to take the first question? Please. Um, so I did discuss this with the code enforcement officer, the most current draft. And, and as you all know, you know, this draft is definitely, the only thing you can rely on is that the draft in front of you tonight is not going to be exactly what is finally adopted. Things are going to be changing all the time, but the, the draft in front of you, um, casts short-term rentals as an accessory use to a residential use. So it would not comply with the first floor non-residential reuse requirement in the town center. Thank you, that was my reaction, but I, uh, and then the second point, uh, assuming that hurdle is crossed somehow, I really, really do not see uh, having a staircase connection internal between the commercial space and the residential above. I, I just think that flies in the face of common sense. And I would personally uh, vote for this only if that were not there. Can I uh, take a stab at this, Maureen? Oh, you're in charge. <laughs> you can do anything you want. So this, this is a uh, single family residence. There's just no way out of it. It's governed by the IRC, which is the residential code. And there's nothing in the residential code that would preclude a stair going from the basement up to the first floor. If it was a commercial building and under the IBC, you could have a stair going to the first floor, but it would have to be enclosed in a one hour shaft and uh, rated doors there would not you I mean you could have it but you couldn't have it as in a typical single family residence but in this case this is this is a, considered a single family residence so I don't I mean I don't see any basis for asking for the stair to be removed I don't know how you do it uh, under what code or oh, under, it's Joe, my point was just under the zoning ordinance, which requires a separation of use between the ground floor and the upper yeah, floor. Yeah, but that's the problem with that. It's the, the that's the problem with the zoning ordinance language, is that it's it's in conflict with itself, because huh? it, short term rental is can only be part of a residential. It can't be. It can't really be a commercial. It, it's not a motel, right? It's not like if the first floor was set up as a motel, you would have a good argument for eliminating the stair. And you'd also be required to have a one hour separation between the first floor and the residence above. But I don't know. That's my take on it. I don't know, Maureen, if you want to 
Do you have anything else on that? Um, well, um, okay. I have spoken to the code officer about, I mean, I think you might remember that I brought this exact issue up at a prior meeting in a prior memo. So I think I've already put, put my position out there that that stare is totally inconsistent with the uh, position that the first floor is a separate non-residential use. Uh, I have spoken to the code officer if this is built as a short-term rental and we expect that there will be limits on the amount of time that you can rent it out as a short-term rental, that means that that space will probably be capped at being vacant two thirds of the year. And um, the code officer has said that he will have serious problems enforcing that. If the property owner decides to use that space as an accessory to their single family home, um, it's going to be very difficult to enforce it. And Joe, let me stress in making that point. I have the highest regard for Dr. Meyerowitz and the, his project in Hillway. I think he's done a fantastic job. I'm not trying to pick on him. It's just that house will be in the general economy and somebody may buy it. And to me, it just invites uh, an abuse of the zoning ordinance to permit uh, the internal access from the residential above to what is supposed to be a commercial operation below. It just, that just doesn't happen. In the real yeah, world. I agree with you. I just, I mean, I don't, and I agree with Maureen, but I think the problem is that the way the ordinance is written is a giant loophole that allows a single family residence to be built uh, where another portion of this zoning ordinance says it cannot be built. I think that's the problem. I, 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 I mean, I, I recognize that it's not keeping with the spirit of having commercial use on the first floor. I've said that right from the beginning. Um, but given the way the zoning ordinance is written, I don't really see I, I don't see how you can not allow what's being proposed, I guess. Is what I'm saying. Could we ask the applicant, how would he, would he object to that requirement of the internal staircase being eliminated? I would, it, I have to have access for it for timely access to the mechanical room. Um, it, it's, it just, it goes against the intent of the design of the building. So that, that we, we would not be, remo uh, be willing to remove that. All right, any of anything else? Okay. Have at it. Have at it, Jim. All right, a motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Two Penguin Properties LLC is requesting site plan review of a mixed use building with a 1,920 square foot short-term rental on the ground floor and one residential unit on the main second floors. An amendment to the Tarbox Triangle subdivision located at 14 Hillway, U22-74-3, which requires review under section 16-2-3 of the subdivision ordinance, section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-6-4D town center design requirements. Two, the Tarbox Triangle subdivision has been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the subdivision ordinance and the findings and decisions of the prior approval, which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. All lots are provided with vehicular access and construction is designed to meet town standards. Four, the subdivision will provide for adequate sewage disposal. Five, the subdivision will provide for adequate solid waste disposal. Six, the proposed, subdiv proposed subdivision will provide for adequate stormwater management. Seven, the subdivision does provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the subdivision and screening as needed. Eight, the plan for the development reflects the natural capabilities of a site to support development. Nine, 
Access to the development will be on roads with adequate capacity to support the traffic generated by the development. Access into and within the site will be safe. Parking will be provided in accordance with 19-7-8 off street parking. The plan does provide for a system of pedestrian ways within the development. 11, the plan does provide for adequate collection and discharge of stormwater. 12, the development will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion plan submitted. 13, the development will be provided with an adequate quantity and quality of potable water. 14, the development will provide for adequate sewage disposal. 15, the development will be provided with access to utilities. 16, the development will not locate, store, or discharge materials harmful to surface or groundwaters. Uh, 17, and is, does that diff, the 17 says the development will provide for adequate disposal of solid waste. Is that, how does that differ from number five? I, you can skip it. Okay, that's what I thought. All right. Um, so we'll I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go with the, the, the number system shown, but I guess unless you want me to subtract one just for since we're skipping 17, does it matter? Well, why don't you just say on the record you want it to be renumbered sequentially and we'll take care of it. Okay, renumbered sequentially. Maureen will handle it. 18, the development will, will not adversely affect the water quality or shoreline of any adjacent water body. 19, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. 20, the development will provide for adequate exterior lighting without excessive illumination. 21, the development will provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the site and screening as needed. 22, the development will not substantially increase noise levels and cause human discomfort. 23, no storage of exterior materials on the site that may be visible to the public is proposed. 24, the planning board is currently reviewing a referral from the town council to amend short-term rental regulations under authority provided in section 19-10-3 of the zoning ordinance. The planning board review of the 14 Hillway project is separate and based on the current, uh, as that's emphasized, current zoning ordinance regulations. 25, town attorney Michael Hill has provided the planning board with an advice, uh, with, with advice a uh, letter dated July 30, 2020, on its ability to provide a project that includes a new short-term rental at a time when the town council had adopted a moratorium on new short-term rental permits effective June 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020, uh, subject to extension. His advice is that the planning board may approve the project, but that any subsequent construction may not be able to obtain a certificate of occupancy if short-term rental regulations in effect when the moratorium ends do not allow issuance of a short-term rental permit for 14 Hill Way. A planning board approval will not create vested rights to create a short-term rental on the first floor. And the planning board has noted that the applicant proceeds at his, its own risk. 26, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance, 16, section 16-3-1, 16 section 19-9, site plan regulation, and section 19-6-4-D, town center design requirements. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of two Penguin Properties LLC for site plan review of a mixed use building with a 1,920 square foot short term rental on the ground floor and one residential unit on the second and third floors and amendments to the Tarbox Triangle subdivision located at 14 Hill Way be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised to address the recommendations in the town engineer's letter dated October 14th, 2020. Two, that monumentation for all lot corners be added to the subdivision plan and installed. Three, that the applicant provide easement deeds for the multi-use easement, stormwater easements, and solid waste access easement 
in a form acceptable to the town attorney and signed by the applicant. Four, that a note be added to the site plan documenting the use of the property as short-term rental on the ground floor and a single residential unit on the second and third floors with a parking calculation consistent with section 19-7-8. Five, that any use occupying the first floor of the building located at 14 Hill Way must be a use included in section 19-6-4B3 non-residential uses. Six, that the parking lot be redesigned to include a van accessible handicapped parking space meeting ADA requirements. Seven, that a planted buffer be provided for the parking lot consistent with the planting, uh, planting proposed along the Scott Dyer Road or Hillway frontage. Eight, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording of the subdivision plat. And nine, that there be no issuance of a building or any other permit until a performance guarantee has been provided in accordance with section 16-2-6. Need a second. I'll second it. Hi, this is Mark. Hey there, how are you? Uh, Mark Boot is still uh, uh, Sunday, what time? Maureen, you can mute him. Oh, there you go. Joe? Sorry about that. Joe? Joe, you're muted. You're muted, Joe. Joe, you've been muted this whole time. <laughs> Joe, unmute. Thank you. Yeah. I, I didn't say anything in court. <laughs> All I, right. I, I heard an inconsistency during the reading of this. And that's all I want to, it's, it's an inconsistency. In the description of the, where it talks about the description of the submission, it refers to the ground floor and one residential unit on the second and third floor. And, and then in where it talks about short-term rental, uh, Number five, under condition, any use occupying the first floor of the building located. So I think we need to be specific that yeah. when we're referring to the short-term rental space, it's the first floor, not the ground floor, in all, in all references. Yeah, I would agree with that. OK. I thought we got rid of the doing the short-term rental gets rid of the requirement for an ADA van space. Is that not correct? It's uh, in the memo, the, the ADA space is not tired, tied to its being a residential use. The ADA space is a requirement of site plan review. Okay. So for example, the Got two it. apartment buildings that were approved in Maxwell Woods, yeah. those are all residential and there's still ADA parking spaces in that parking lot. Okay. Got it. All right, we this have a on, second. On condition four, where it says ground floor, there's a consensus by the person who made the motion and the person second in the motion to make that first floor. Correct. Yes. Thank you. It also would hold true in the general description. Right, right at the top of the page. At the top page. of the page. Okay. Yes. And the general description at the beginning of the findings of that. Okay, I think those are the places where it showed up. Okay, Carolyn. Well, hearing someone else read it made it click. <laughs> yeah, I missed that the first time. All right, any other comments? Rick. So I'm, I'm hoping it's appropriate for me to comment on these conditions. Uh, at this at this time, if it's not, then then please let me know. But um, there are a few that I've got either questions or concerns about. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the plans to be revised to address the recommendations in the town engineer's letter uh, dated October 14th, 2020. Um, 
I just want to be clear that that the the town engineer leaves uh, several points to board's discretion regarding the uh, regarding items like parking, um, the ADA access, um, and uh, and I, I think there are there are a couple others as well, and I, I think it for clarity's sake. Those are potentially items that need to be addressed by this board, rather than sending it back to the engineer's letter, uh, where we haven't, you know, where there's basically not been resolution of, of some of those items. <clears throat> um, the uh, the ADA parking being an obvious one, as well as the the uh, uh, the parking calculation consistent with section nineteen seven eight. Um, no, I, I, I might. Wait, so, are you saying you're you disagreeing with the ADA parking requirement? Um. Yes. I think it's. I I would say that it's a a residence. Um. I think it's a town. It's yes. It's a, Maureen. You said it's a town requirement. It's under site plan review. It's not tied to whether or not a use is commercial or residential. It's under you, site plan standards. And this project you, needs site plan review, so you need to meet the site plan standards. If you were proposing just an apartment building, you would still need to include a handicap accessible space in the parking lot. My apologies, so, Morgan. I didn't, I didn't mean to speak over you there. Um, when, you, when you refer to the ADA, uh, manual for this though, um, for, for, uh, it's the requirement is not under the ADA. The requirement is under the town site review. Well, the, 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 the standard, I'm wrong though, but the requirement is, is to follow ADA regulations. And if you go to the ADA regulations for this, uh, a residence that's sleeping less than, than five. What? No, the requirement mm -hmm is not to follow the ADA. The requirement is to provide an ADA compliant parking space. Because it's part of site review. That's the town requirement. It could also say an ANSI 117 space, or it could say any kind of space. It's not, but the requirement is not per the ADA. Okay, Paul. That's all right. Carol Ann. So, Rick, you mentioned other items in the letter. Could you be more specific? Through the chair? Yes. I might be able to help a little bit on that. I, I'm Thank you. going over the town engineer's letter. I believe that anywhere the town engineer raises an issue and says things like, um, the planning board should determine if this situation is acceptable. That means that if the board determines not to do anything with that town engineer comment, no further action would be needed. So I think most, makes it easier. most of the comments that are related to the planning board should determine you, you can either, either they have to have been addressed by the board when you make your motion for approval or they, they are considered that you address them by not moving any further. Does that help, Rick? I, I, I think so. So I would go through, I mean, a, a few of those comments. <clears throat> so like the width of the driveway is a good example. Right, exactly. And the planning board was fine with it. So you don't have to address. Um, the designer has noted that the driveway and sidewalk along Scott Dyer Road can be utilized to access the front entrance. However, this approach does not meet applicable criteria for an ADA compliant accessible route. Such an accessible route would not be required for short term rentals. However, should the use change in the future, an accessible route would be required. The planning board should also determine if this situation is acceptable based on the outcome of the short term rental use discussion. Well, right. So we can't do anything based on the, uh, the uh, short-term rental discussion because we're only dealing with the zoning ordinance as it stands now. So I know the engineer wrote that on every item in there, but 
we can't really use that as a basis for anything. This is, this is the part where you're taking your chances with an unknown of where the short-term rental rules are going. And uh, we're looking at them as they exist today and, and not as we think they might exist in six months. Well, we're approving the submission based on they, how they stand today. Based on how they stand today. Exactly. And if it changes, so, if it changes then we'll see you. So. If I understand correctly, we'll you know, yeah, if I understand correctly, though, the building is approved, you know, the building's approved based on current zoning. Correct. Occupying, receiving a permit is only contingent upon satisfaction of the fact that the short-term rental moratoriums end. There's not a revisit on the zoning. So. The, the yeah, that's above our pay grade. Yeah. Right. We, we look at the plan, say approved or disapproved and then move on. Okay, I think those were the ones that were unclear. I, and again, I, I don't mean to be a pain about it. I just didn't not want to be problem. Yeah, where fine. later on we, we were stuck wondering, <laughs> wondering what to yeah. address. And I'd also like to comment, uh, you know, the, the comments on the plantings um, as a buffer between the parking lot and the adjacent red barn. Um, that's a recommendation by the town. I haven't heard any comment on that by the planning board. Um, you know, I certainly want my building to be tasteful, uh, but again, that's a fairly thin space and pending the development, I'd like to reserve the right to, if I have to put a buffering, I reserve the right whether to put in some additional forsythia versus an extension of the fence that we have bordering lot two and three. Hmm. It would seem to me that, that it might make sense to talk to the the people bordering you and seeing seeing if they even want anything or not. I'm, I would assume. I mean, well, I know we're past. really far into this. Yeah. These are questions that should have come up during the discussion. Uh, the comment about plantings that um, so I don't know. I don't know where to go with that. Yeah, I mean, the plan we're approving or not approving is the plan you got, so. And I'm fine with that. I can always, we can deal with it on the back end. Okay. Um, so I think that about does it unless somebody really wants to make a comment here. Maureen. Sorry, um, I'm just a little okay. concerned and make sure it's clear that if the board approves a requirement for plantings the only way to remove that requirement is to come back to the planning board well yes that's true i mean, I mean that's true of everything on the site plan mm -hmm. i do believe that there's as we experience in our prior submission there's an opportunity to change the planting in a i don't know what the term is maureen can can offer the correct term but i believe substitutions or can be done as a there's a separate term that doesn't have to go all the way back to planning board a de minimis change would not be swapping out a fence in a fence and in lieu of planting a de minimis change would be changing the type of plants that you are going to put in so thank you for the clarification so i think we were a little surprised to see the the buffering as a condition of approval it is the board i uh, considering a, approving the plan as is or approving it with that condition of approval with that condition with, yes with the condition of approval thank you for letting us know all right okay maureen Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Uh, no, but I will change my vote if that internal staircase is removed. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Mr. Gillot. Yes. Okay, the vote is. Uh, Did you forget Mr. Hubner? Oh, yeah. Hubner. I did. She did. 
Oh, okay. All right, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you folks for your time. Yeah. Thank you. All right, onward. All right, the next item on the agenda. Joe Frustashi is request, requesting an amendment to the Rosewood subdivision to split lot 4B to create a new lot and extend the private road right of way for Rosewood Drive to create frontage for the lot. The application was deemed complete and a public hearing has been scheduled for this evening. The plan will be reviewed under section 1625 of the subdivision ordinance. Hey Joe, excuse me for, for button in on what's on the agenda for the Code 26 Shore Road, wasn't it? Yeah, was that remote? No, I'm in the wrong order. Thank you. All right. That was just a drill. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Maureen, Mark Putin's still showing up as uh, someone speaking who can speak. Is there a way to demote him again? I thought I had, you're right, it does look until oh, there I it is. put my, my cursor on it and then it does something different, but I will. All right, sorry guys. Listen. Yep, okay. Um, and I think, hang on, I'm, I have to promote more people, Joe. I was on board with you. <laughs> Maureen, you were just following blindly in Joe's lead, huh? Well, he is the chair. <laughs> All right, take two. Redtail Properties LLC is requesting site plan review of proposed amendments to the site plan for 1226 Shore Road to add an eight space parking lot and change the use of building B from storage to village retail. The application is, is amending the site plan approval granted on September 17th, 2002, and subsequently amended on September 21st, 2004, August 18th, 2009, and October 19th, 2010. The application has been deemed complete and public hearing scheduled for this evening. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19.9 site plan regulation. So we'll begin with um, the applicant reviewing any. We will open the uh, meeting to a public hearing. So Steve Bushy, I imagine you are here on behalf of the client. I am Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Lucas okay. uh, is also here, I see uh, with us. So uh, I'll be very brief. This is our third uh, appearance before you folks for uh, the development or renovations and uh, reoccupancy of the existing building at 1226 Shore Road. Uh, and Dr. Homitz is looking to move his dental practice, High Tide Dental, from the corner of Mitchell and Ocean House Road over to uh, this location. That building at 1226, as many of you may know, uh, previously had been a medical practice. So it seems like this is a fitting uh, use uh, to go in. Our site plan that we presented to you pre previously uh, included just a, a few minor pieces. They've got the utility improvements, including a generator to which we uh, have replied to some staff comments and uh, have added a, a fence uh, around that. The generator is there certainly only for the purposes of uh, 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 power outage during the course of a medical procedure. So uh, we would expect it would be rather uncommon for it to be used, but we have provided some measures to uh, decrease the sound levels associated with that. Steve, we'll be, yep. Hold that. I want to let you know that I've made you the host if you want to share the site plan while you're making your presentation. Can do. I can find my proper, bear with me for a moment. Don't rush. That's how I get tripped up. <laughs> Let 
looking for my proper screen. I can put it up if you'd like. Yeah, you might have to. Uh, it's not showing up on my uh, screens to share. I'm not sure I have it. I have the plan open. So if you could uh, make me the host again, if you go to the participants list, um, you'll find my name and on the right under more, you can make me a host. Done. Yep, I got it. Hopefully you see that now. So uh, thank you, Maureen. Uh, she's brought up the site plan, which to the left of the uh, plan is Shore Road and the existing access road that uh, comes in off Shore Road provides access not only to the site uh, and to an existing parking lot and building B to the rear of the site, but in the middle of the site uh, that's a currently a lawn area, we're proposing a small parking lot uh, of eight spaces along with a solid waste enclosure piece that would uh, be used for patients and visitors coming to the dental practice that will be in building A, uh, the existing uh, larger building. Um, we've added a few things uh, to the earlier plans based on staff and peer review comments, principally, as you'll note on this drawing, a small rain garden area uh, to account for stormwater management purposes. So a rain garden is relatively common. I'm assuming uh, there are a number of those in Cape Elizabeth. It's basically a low depressional area that will allow the water to come off of the uh, paved parking lot and uh, allow it to be uh, treated with the vegetation that will be planted in that little low area. Relatively standard and uh, uh, we think is a, a nice addition uh, to uh, liven up the, the space with some landscaping. Uh, I'll note, as I said earlier, the generator just behind the back of the building and a small screening fence that will be uh, installed next to that to uh, keep the noise levels to uh, below the town's standards at the property line. And in this case, we do have a residential property there to the uh, north side of, uh, of the site. So um, besides that, the uh, rear parking lot will be used by dental uh, uh, staff and uh, those who may be visiting the rear building at some point in the future. We don't have any uh, uh, particular plans. We've suggested that it could be a uh, retail use in the future, but at this point in time, uh, there's no immediate tenant or otherwise uh, on board yet. So uh, that remains uh, unoccupied for a, a bit of time. I know the folks uh, have done some renovation in uh, removing some items in that space uh, to comply with the uh, discussions they've had with the code folks. So they've more or less cleaned up that uh, rear building. Uh, the staff comments and peer review comments uh, as related to your perspective uh, findings and uh, motion uh, tonight that we're hopeful you folks will take a, a positive action after the public hearing. We've reviewed those, have no objection to those. The peer reviewer from Sebago Tech made a couple of comments in regards to uh, signage and uh, some dimensional measurements to be placed on the plan for the ADA spaces. And Maureen, if you could just pan to the left a little bit, the uh, two ADA spaces in front of the building towards Shore Road. Uh, they've asked to just have some dimensions in their comments. And we do have a couple of signs that are placed there uh, in front of those two spaces. They've, uh, um, the peer reviewer also asked to have the site distances, which exceed the town's requirement, I believe, which is 250 feet in each direction. And we're well over 350 feet in each direction for site distance. And for the record, we'll put that on the plan uh, so that the town has that in your files. So uh, relatively straightforward reoccupancy of an existing building. Uh, looking forward to uh, uh, hopefully an approval tonight that will allow uh, High Tide Dental to uh, 
continue and, and complete their renovations and uh, occupancy of the, the building A for their dental practice. Uh, with that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I would turn it back to the board so you could uh, open up the public hearing. And if there are any questions, I'm here to answer them. Okay, before we uh, jump into the public hearing, is there anybody who has a quick question for Steve? Regarding one, okay. Um, then uh, the planning board meeting is now, is that a question? The planning board meeting will now be open to a public hearing. Uh, is there anyone listening who wishes to speak? You can go ahead and raise your hand. All right, I do not see anyone raising your, their hand. I'll give you a couple more seconds here. Okay, seeing no one wishing to speak, uh, the meeting, the public hearing is now closed. Do any of the board members have any questions or comments on the uh, application? Okay, uh, what did, did we ever figure out the address for the building B? Yes, um, the town assessor has assigned an address number that's different from 1226. I think it's 1228, I can't remember exactly. And the applicant Correct. agreed with that address. And it's on Shore, so it's on Shore Road. That road, the road to the parking lot doesn't have a name, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, Jonathan. Yeah, I was just going to say, this is a property that I feel like this um, board has looked a lot at uh, with regards to the previous submission, which is obviously a lot different than this submission. This submission is basically leaving the building as is and just changing the parking lot um, and then redesign or uh, um, reclassifying the back building. So I, I'm, uh, there's not too much for me to say on this one. Okay, would, uh, there's no other questions or comments. Would someone like to make a motion? I have a motion for the board to consider. Okay. Uh, findings of fact, number one, Red Tail Properties LLC is requesting site plan review of proposed amendments to the site plan for 1226 Shore Road to add eight, an eight space parking lot and change the use of the building B from storage to village retail, which requires review under section 19-9 site plan regulations. Number two, the plan for the development reflects the natural capabilities of the site to support development. Number three, access to development uh, will be on roads with adequate capacity to support the traffic generated by the development. Access into and within the site will be safe. Parking will be provided in accordance with section 19-7-8 off-street parking. Number four, the plan does provide for a system of pedestrian ways within the development. Number five, the plan does provide for adequate collection and discharge of stormwater. Number six, the development will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion plan submitted. Number seven, the development will be provide or will uh, will be provided with an adequate quantity and quality of potable water. Uh, number eight, the development will provide for adequate sewage disposal. Number nine, the development will. Uh, be provided with access to utilities. Number 10, the development will locate store and discharge material or will not di locate store or discharge materials harmful to surface or groundwaters. Number 11, the development will provide for adequate disposal of solid waste. Number 12, the development will not adversely affect the water quality or shoreline of an, any adjacent water body. Number 13, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. Number 14, the development will provide for adequate exterior lighting without excessive illumination. Number 15, the development will provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the site and screening as needed. Number 16, the development will not substantially uh, increase noise levels and cause human discomfort. Number 17, storage of exterior materials on the site may, that may be visible to the public will not or will be screened by fencing or landscaping. Number 18, the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations. 
Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Red Tail Properties LLC for site plan review of proposed amendments to the site plan for 1226 Shore Road to add an eight space parking lot and change the use of building B from storage to village retail be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated October 14th, 2020. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments? Maureen, you wanna take a roll call, please? Mr. Podensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Mr. Shalott. Yes. Motion is unanimous. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maureen. Very, very good. Okay. Moving on. Next item on the agenda, the Rosewood third subdivision amendment. Joe Fristashi is requesting an amendment to the Rosewood subdivision to split lot 4B to create a new lot and extend the private road right of way for Rosewood Drive to create frontage for the lot. The application was deemed complete and a public hearing has been scheduled for this evening. The plan will be reviewed under section 1625 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. So we'll begin with a summary from the applicant on any changes made to the plans. Um, and uh, Peter, are you, you're here on behalf of the applicant? Yes, yes, okay. I believe Joe, Joe is here too if we uh, need him for any questions. Great. So why don't you go ahead and are you going to show a plan or do you want Maureen to bring it up? Um, well, I, uh, I've made you host Peter, but if you can't get okay. the plan up, I can, I can make, I can display it. Well, let me see if I can uh, give it a go here. Okay. Uh, can everybody see that? You see it yep. on the file list. You can see your menu. Um, open up the plan. Yeah, yeah. Open it up. How's that? There you go. Yeah. Oh, much better. Okay. Um, we had four changes to the plan. Um, we had these uh, red rectangles that you see here. And I can uh, zoom in a little bit. Uh, all had to do with uh, Portland Water District uh, water line connections. So um, nothing, uh, nothing impacting capacity or anything else, just um, the way that they would like those lines connected. So that was uh, one change we made. Um, and that was all based on the sketch that was in, uh, that we submitted as part of our last uh, 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 submission. Um, then, uh, the other uh, change was adding these pins where you see each one of these red uh, arrows uh, was a corner pin for the lot 4C. And that was a comment from the uh, peer review engineer in conjunction with um, the public works director. Um, back Those are this. pins or monuments? Uh, they, they are pins. And we asked, so we asked the Portland uh, or the public works director what he would like, and he was fine with an iron uh, iron rod. Okay. Um, we're we were fine doing either. We asked him what he would like us to use, and he said the iron rod would be fine. Um, uh, minor uh, north arrow was added to the plan. We somehow we uh, lost that on the last round. And then on um, the subdivision plan, we added a, a note eight, uh, which stated uh, there shall be no sale of lots nor issuance of building permits nor site work commenced until the required performance guarantee has been approved in accordance with section 16-2-6C of this ordinance. Um, and those were the, uh, those were the um, 
uh, total of the changes. I did, uh, I did notice uh, one thing in uh, the staff memo that I thought I should uh, talk about, and that is item number six, where it says under buffering, it says an evergreen tree buffer planting is proposed along the common 4B, 4C property line and the remaining property lines about permanently protected town open space. Uh, the original subdivision boundary lines include the area now preserved as open space. But we actually had proposed this evergreen buffer uh, here between lot 4C and the public area uh, because of the trail. Um, so this property line between uh, 4B and 4C, uh, we were not proposing anything. There's some existing vegetation over there. Uh, Joe um, and his son own this house and live there and they would be building on this uh, lot. So we thought we would just go with the existing vegetation here. And if when they go ahead and develop that um, or want to change something here, uh, they could add um, buffering there at that time, depending on what, uh, what they do with that lot. Uh, but the buffering that we were proposing was over here. Um, and I guess that that's uh, it for our changes and um, uh, yeah, that's um, that's that's it. Uh, Maureen, I have a question. Buffering is usually between a subdivision and what's not a subdivision. You don't generally require buffering between lots within a subdivision. No, right? you reminded me exactly why I wrote what I did. So yes, and because the original Rosewood subdivision included the conservation of all this land next to it, I think you can continue to count that towards the buffering requirement. And um, Mr. Beagle is correct that I, I put it in the wrong place, but the buffering, um, I mean, it looks like the, the different sides of this lot that are not the common property line of 4C already are bordered on all sides by the open space that is permanently protected and owned by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Okay. All right, any quick questions before I open it up to the public hearing? This goes, with, this goes with the buffering. He mentioned they might want to do something between 4B and 4C in the future. Uh, if it's outside the building envelope, they can't do anything there. Is that correct? Um, um, you, can add, you can add buffering. You can add buffering. What we tell people you is can't change. You can't remove anything, but you exactly. can add stuff. So okay. unless the board has made, a, uh, unless there's been a specific decision by the board to not have something in a place, um, the, 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 the usual advice is you can always add more. You just can't take out without meeting that de diseased or dead and dying tree requirement. Okay. All right, I'm good. Okay, so I'm gonna open the meeting to the public hearing. Uh, is there anybody listening who wishes to make a comment on this application? Joe? Maureen? Uh, May I ask if Peter would be willing to return hosting duties to me? Oh, yes, you. you may. Okay. All right, and I want to participate. Hands up. How you do can... I get in? Joe Fustashi. Yes. Oh, did you want to, you're on, but did you want to make a, a comment in addition to Peter's comment? Yes, I, I yes. Yes, I do okay. want to make a comment. All uh, right. So then, this the, is not part of the public hearing. No, it's on. It's a question on the on the removal of trees in the, um, in the non-building envelope. Uh, we may have a problem with that because uh, of the septic design, the septic system. Now, is that allowable to cut some of the trees down? This is going to be on, on septic system. Uh, and this, quite honestly, I did not know that the non-building envelope area is a non-cut buffered area. 
Marine's looking at something I can see her. I don't think, I think the no cutting area is the buffer, is the outside the building. Yes, but this is what I'm saying, that we may have a problem with that because the location of the septic system, um, I believe is going to be on the back uh, left of the lot and that would require us cutting some trees down on the, um, or in the no, now it's the no cut buffered area uh, outside the building envelope. All right. Okay, Maureen, uh, you got, you know, yeah. It's, it's so really it, interesting, it just. It's a good point. Um, I remember when, I, I probably shouldn't, but I remember when the original Rosewood subdivision was approved, we ended up having two things. We had a building envelope and then we also had a clearing area because this was the same issue we had on the other lots that are on Rosewood Drive. So um, probably this could be addressed by putting a condition on the approval that the building envelope, the area outside the building envelope that needs to be cleared for the septic system would be allowed. And that's a determination that the board can make? Well, I think you can make it a condition of approval and then um, we can say that the applicant shall amend the plan to show that. And then you can either, you can de delegate to me to make sure that it's put on the plan and it's, it's limited to what needs to be cut down to install the septic. Or you could table this and ask the applicant to put it on a plan and bring it back next month. That's, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, if, can you, by ordinance, can you put the septic system within the outside, I'm sorry, outside the building envelope? Yes, you can. And it, in fact, it happens a lot. Okay. Uh, Peter. Um, I, I believe, looking at the uh, site plan, that most of the septic system even though it's slightly uh, part of it slightly outside the building envelope, it looks like from our survey that our tree line goes around that. So, <clears throat> excuse me, any uh, clearing I think would be minimal okay. in, in that location. We're outside the building envelope, but we're, uh, uh, that area has been previously, um, uh, there aren't big trees there that we would need to be taking down for the most part. But we could still add that as a note of uh, yes. condition of approval. <clears throat> okay, so getting back to our public hearing, I'm going to just reopen the meeting for a minute here and see if there's anybody out there who wishes to make a comment regarding this application. Well, there's 13 attendees, but no one's raising their hand. Okay, seeing none, the public hearing is closed. Um, so board members, are there any other questions regarding this application? It seems very straightforward to me. No, I think they've addressed everything. Yeah, okay, let's get a motion. I'm glad you brought up the septic system. <laughs> Thank you. Peter, was that you raising your hand? No, uh, I'm happy to do this one if you want. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Joe Fistacci is requesting an amendment to the Rosewood subdivision to split lot 4B to create a new four, lot 4C. <clears throat> Pardon me. And extend the private road right away for Rosewood Drive to create frontage for the lot, which requires review under section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. Two. The Rosewood subdivision has been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the subdivision ordinance and the findings of the decisions of the prior approval, which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. Three, the subdivision amendment will have a sufficient quantity and quality of potable water. <coughs> Four, the subdivision amendment will not cause soil erosion based upon the erosion control plan provided. Five, the subdivision amendment <clears throat> will not cause unreasonable road congestion or unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic. The private road extension is laid out to conform to existing topography as much as possible. All lots 
are provided with vehicular access. The road extension is designed to meet private road uh, town standards with the exception of waivers that are granted for an off-center off road and 45 foot wide right of way. Six, the subdivision amendment <clears throat> will provide for adequate sewage disposal. Seven, the subdivision amendment will provide for adequate solid waste disposal. Eight, the subdivision amendment will not have an undue adverse effect on scenic or natural areas, historic sites, significant wildlife habitat, rare natural areas, or public access to the shoreline. Nine, the subdivision amendment is compatible with the applicable provisions of the comprehensive plan and town ordinances. And the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. 11, the subdivision amendment will not adversely affect the quality or quantity of groundwater. 12, the subdivision amendment is not located in a floodplain. 13, the subdivision amendment does, uh, does not include uh, wetland alterations. 14, the subdivision amendment will provide for adequate stormwater management. 15, the subdivision amendment does provide for access to direct sunlight. 16, the subdivision amendment <coughs> um, includes a vegetated buffer throughout and around the subdivision and screening is needed. 17, the subdivision will comply with the open space impact fee with the payment of $6,729. 18, the subdivision amendment, <coughs> excuse me, uh, will be provided with access to utilities. 19, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance section 16-3-1. Is there an amendment, uh, a condition to be added uh, relating to the septic thing? Yes, sir. Do you want me to draw something right this second? Not heard. You can, you well, still need to read the motion, and you can do uh, condition one, uh, and then throw we'll together. Take a friendly amendment to plug it in. Okay. Uh, therefore, therefore, be it ordered that based upon the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joe Frustachi for an amendment to the Rosewood subdivision to split lot four B to create a new lot four C and extend the private road right of way for Rosewood Drive to create frontage for the lot be approved subject to the following conditions. Uh, one, that the plans be revised to address the recommendations of the town engineer's later, letter dated October 13, 2020. Two, that the applicant pay an open space impact fee of $6,729. Three, that the road maintenance agreement be submitted in a form acceptable to the town attorney and signed and recorded by the applicant. Four, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval and the conditions satisfied prior to the recording of subdivision plot. Uh, do I have a second? Second. And Maureen, do you have a uh, condition? Yes, I would propose that this be the condition four and that condition four be renumbered condition five. And it would be that the area of the septic system within the building envelope may be cleared as needed for functioning of the system. You mean outside the building? You mean the outside, don't you? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Outside. Yes. Okay. Sorry. It's always a question of what's beyond the setback, right? Uh, you do accept you accept that? that? Friendly? I accept it. Okay. The uh, amendment is accepted. Any co comments, questions? Yeah, okay, I, more. Uh, I've got one. Jim, yes. Uh, 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 finding effect number 15, the subdivision amendment does provide for access to direct sunlight. I never remember seeing that anywhere before. I didn't know that was something you had to actually say. I actually, I, I've been making it up and waiting for someone to notice it. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a requirement of the state subdivision law. And that's why it's in our our standard of review as well. Okay, all right, now I know. And it's been in there every time. All right, I guess this time I'm awake, I don't know. It's a key <laughs> provision, Jim. If you want next month, I can try to make some up and see if you can find them. Okay, Where, where's Waldo kind of thing, huh? All right. Hey, Maureen, can you take a- uh, oh, Hey, Joe, the, Joe, this is Dan. I got one question to Maureen, um, just, 
to help me out, the, the open space impact fee, can you just go over that? Yes, so under the subdivision ordinance um, and every, uh, there's a, it's something we call an impact fee standard and you can meet that standard either by donating about 15,000 square feet of open space or payment of this fee. Um, and as this developer has continued to add new lots, every new lot, he's paid the fee because he does not have land to donate to. And, and the donation has to make sense. It can't be just what little corner. So um, that's the easier, well, it is the cleaner way to meet the open space requirement, but it is a requirement of every subdivision. Most developers will meet it by um, setting aside open space as Mr. Frustashi did when he uh, got the Rosewood subdivision approved and the Blueberry Ridge subdivision approved, all that open space that you see on this plan came out of those two subdivisions. Great, okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I'll start the roll call, Chair. Yes, please do. Mr. Budensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Mr. Gilbert? Right, yes. On. Oh, there he is. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hubner? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Chair Shalott? Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Just thank you. Okay, moving on. Next item. Hang on, Peter. You need to make me host again? Okay. Um, Sorry, Joe. Okay. Or you, or you have to stay, one or the other. Thank you. Okay, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is requesting a resource protection permit to construct 13 boardwalks and bridges in wetlands, totaling 1,428 square feet on the Pollock Brook Preserve located at 498 Spurwink Ave. The application was deemed complete and a public hearing has been scheduled for this evening. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 1983 resource protection regulations. Um, so Philip and Cindy, hi, you have to turn your mics on. Yeah. Philip, do you want me to make you host? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Sorry for interrupting. Problem. Okay, so take it away, Philip. There we go. So thank you for having us as always. Um, we had a site walk a couple weeks ago and uh, more or less all of the additional information I submitted were things that we discussed at the site walk. Um, one of the main things we talked about specifically, um, I think we were standing over by spot number 13, um, was the idea of doing sort of a two-phase development, which would give us some flexibility in terms of extending some of the boardwalks as needed come spring when there's a little more water on the ground. Um, and we did follow through with that recommendation from Maureen. And so you'll notice that three of the boardwalks we've identified sort of an additional boardwalk section. So in that area, enough boardwalk to cover the sort of fern area that was around. Um, in a, sec a similar sort of situation at boardwalk four. Um, and then at boardwalk five, that was a boardwalk close to the bridge. And we essentially are building into this enough leeway to add boardwalk all the way up to the start of the bridge, um, which especially if it does end up being sort of a heavily used trail might become necessary. I think the only other small change was locations two and three were functionally the same. So I just made them, listed them as one. Um, and then section one, we made the length a little bit longer. Otherwise, I don't think there are any changes um, from what has been previously discussed with you. I do want to make one additional clarification in terms of the actual design. So at the confirmation or at the um, conservation committee, we discussed the designs of the structures we're working on. Um, and 
this just for visualization is sort of the standard boardwalk segment that we're working with, which we now have done up in a more professional design. Um, and then to reiterate the actual bridge standards we're working from are provided by the National Park Service. Um, this is sort of the standard design. The main difference is that we are not including railings and these, these plans do include a non-railing variant. They just don't have a drawing of them included here. Um, Maureen also recommended that I be as clear as possible about things we might change relative to this design. Um, one of the things we are considering for the stringers, this plan recommends some fairly large timbers and especially for the longer span, it may be hard to source wood of that size, especially because there's sort of a, a wood shortage at the moment. Um, and so we were, we're hoping that we can consider a glue laminated stringer as well. Um, and there's basically an identical variant of these plans that gives us the specs for what would be appropriate structurally for a span of this scale. Um, using glue laminated instead of timbers. I think that's all. Um, sorry if that was a lot of all at once, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have up front. Is the glue lamb uh, uh, pressure treated? Uh, well, not not per se. It's it's so it's a engineered wood that's basically created under pressure with an adhesive. But, but does it have some way to, uh, to preserve in, in the moisture? Yes, and we were recommended that um, when we were actually talking to a lumber supplier, apparently it's one of the things that they commonly recommend for snowmobile bridges and other similar applications to what we're doing. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna open the meeting Oh, I'm sorry, Cindy, did you have anything that you wanted to say? Well, thank you, Philip. That's great. There was, you and I had discussed one element. I didn't know if you were bringing that up about the, after you cross the bridge, the boardwalk might go in a more of a straight line. Or uh, yeah. Thanks for the reminder on that. Hold on one second, let me. Um, so just, so one, Clarification as well in terms of the way that we put out the flags on our site walk. Um, I realized in conversation with Army Corps earlier last week and, and earlier this week that what we were describing as the span was not necessarily sort of what they would technically define as the span of the structure. Um, what we're saying is that the distance is 26 feet from bank to bank that we're spanning across. And the abutments are placed just beyond that. So just to be clear, um, those areas would be just beyond where the flags were on our sidewalk. And that is very critical to what permitting we fall under with Army Corps. So that's why I specifically mentioned that here. And we're considering possibly making that the angled piece after the bridge straight, Philip, is that right? Or, or we're not considering that anymore? Yeah, we did. So, and then we didn't specify or I showed on the existing trail where the sort of angle, the dog leg in the current trail is. Um, and originally, as I had described it, we were considering making it a little bit straighter potentially, or just locating that wherever we have the most dry ground to place that final abutment. So just wanting to be clear that those, those may change slightly compared to what the current structure is. Okay. Um. All right, I'm gonna open up the meeting to public hearing. So if anybody wishes to make any comments, now is the time to uh, raise your hand. So and... Bill, if you could make me the host again. Sure. I, th I just got a note that says you were. He's just, he's just so efficient. Uh, nobody's raised their hand. Okay, so the public hearing is closed. Uh, board members, do you have any other questions or comments? Carol Ann? You mentioned Army Corps. I was just wondering what the status is of the conversations or with the work with DEP and Army Corps? Are you, yeah, absolutely. Do you have your permits or? So, in so, um, 
I'll, do, uh, I'll just DEP first. So we fall under two different exemptions for DEP. Um, in the case of the bridge, because we are replacing a existing stream crossing, we're exempt from doing um, a permit for the bridge itself. Uh, and we, we have a, I had a conversation with them and have emails that I think were in my original application that um, just confirmed that because it's a little bit unusual compared to the normal sort of culverts. Um, and then in terms of the other impacts, we're planning to take advantage of a exemption for smaller impacts under a certain square footage. Um, 4,300 square feet is the total that they allow, which we're well under. So we, we don't require a DEP permit. Um, and then in terms of Army Corps, what they're requiring us is self-verification, which just means completing a form and submitting it to them at least two weeks in advance of the start of build to give them a chance to ask any additional questions. Thank you. All right, anything else? Okay, anybody want to make a motion here? Joe, I'll, Joe, I'll make a motion. Thank you. Uh, motion for findings of fact. Uh, number one, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is requesting a resource protection permit to construct 13 broad rocks and bridges and wetlands totaling 1,428 square feet on the Pollock Brook Preserve located at 498 Spurwink Ave, uh, U43-8-5, which requires review under section 19-8-3 resource protection permit regulations. Number two, the proposed broad rocks and bridges uh, will material will not material obstruct the flow or the flow of surface and or subsurface waters across or from the alteration area. Number three, the proposed boardwalks and bridges um, will not impound surface waters or reduce the absorption absorbent cap capacity of the alteration area so as to cause or increase the flooding of adjacent properties. Number four, the proposed boardwalks and bridges. Uh, will not increase the flow of surface waters across or the discharge of surface waters from the alteration area so as to threaten injury to the alteration area or to upstream and or downstream lands by flooding, draining, erosion, sedimentation, or otherwise. Number five, the proposed boardwalks and bridges um, will not result in significant damage to spawning grounds or habitat for aquatic life, birds, or others wildlife. Number six, proposed, proposed boardwalks and bridges will not pose problems related to the support of structures. Number seven, the proposed boardwalks and bridges will not be detrimental to uh, aquifer recharge or the quantity or quality of groundwater. Number eight, the proposed boardwalks and bridges will not disturb coastal dunes or contiguous uh, back dune areas. Number nine, the proposed boardwalks and bridges uh, will maintain or improve ecological and aesthetic values. Number 10, the proposed boardwalks and bridges will be constructed and located to maximize wetland buffers and adjacent land uses. Number 11, the boardwalks and bridges uh, will be accomplished in conformance with the erosion prevention provisions of the Environmental Quality Handbook, Erosion and Sediment Control, published by the Maine Soil and Water Conservation Commission dated March 1986 or subsequent revisions thereof. Number 12, the boardwalks and bridges will be accomplished without discharging wastewater from buildings or from other construction into wastewater treatment facilities in violation um, uh, of section 15-1-4 of the sewage ordinance. Uh, the, and the and the number 13, the proposed boardwalks and bridges, um, I guess that should be, uh, are not located in the 100 year floodplain. Uh, number 14, the application substantially complies with section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations, therefore be it ordered and based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for the resource protection permit to construct 13 boardwalks and bridges and wetlands totaling 1,428 square feet on the Pollock Brook Preserve located at 498 Spurwink Ave, uh, U43-8-5 be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated October 13, 2020. Number two, the erosion control measures be added to the application. Number three, that there be no alteration to the site, not issuance of any local permits until the plans 
have been revised to address the above conditions and submitted to the town planner for review. Second. Thank you. Any discussion, comments? Okay, Maureen, can you take a roll call vote, please? Mr. Podensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Starbeck. Yes. Derek Shalott. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you both. Thank you, all of you. Yes, thank all of you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Looking forward to walking it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great property. All right, we're only about 10 minutes behind here. So we're doing pretty good. That's not bad. <laughs> we could do worse. <laughs> okay. The town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting site plan review of a new 180 foot tall public safety communications tower to be located at 8 Denison Drive. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19.9 site plan regulations and section 19.8.12 tower and antenna performance standards. Um, so who's here? I see Steve Harding, Peter Gleason, Paul Fenton. Uh, who's going to be uh, representing the, uh, who wants to go first? Hi, Joe. This is Steve Harding. Um, I was going to let uh, Chief Gleason do a, just an introduction of the project, uh, and then I can follow up with more of the technical details. Okay, sounds good. Do you need a, uh, are you going to show the plan, or do you want Maureen to do uh, that? I can, show the, I can show the plan. All right, I'm going to yeah. promote you to host. It's all yours. Okay, Steve, you're on. Um, Peter, do you want to start out and I'll try to get my screen over? Sure, I'm just going to give a brief overview of where we are now and what we're proposing to do. Currently, uh, the three entities, the police department, fire department, and public works have uh, antennas and radios located at three different sites. Uh, the public works is at the transfer station. Uh, police department is located on a private tower on Bowery Beach Road. And the fire department is on a temporary tower located on top of the bottle shed at the transfer station. Uh, these locations give us some significant gaps in our coverage, particularly for both the fire and police on the northern end of town. Um, Steve has some new radio coverage maps that will show the benefits of uh, us relocating all our operations to the proposed site. Uh, on our current locations, none of our sites have uh, generators. So when there is a power failure, we have to uh, acquire gasoline generators from different locations, bring them to the radio sites, plug them in and get them running. And quite often this happens in storms and when we're already tied up with lots of other issues and to pull people away to get uh, power to our radios is, can be challenging. Uh, the other thing is when the power goes out, there is no indication that our radios have lost power until uh, dispatch center tries to transmit a call and nobody responds. So it's essential that we get automatic generating power to it. Um, again, the radios are a critical part of our operation. Uh, right now, with our current tower being a, a rather short tower, we are having trouble sometimes getting the pagers activated in areas of the town. And for the call company members, it's essential that they get those messages on their pagers or telephones. So uh, this will give us significantly better coverage. Uh, basically, we're looking to consolidate all of our operations in one spot and to give us control over that site with generator power. So that's a brief history of where we are and where we'd like to go. 
Thank you, Chief. Um, can everybody see my screen with the plan up? Yes. Yep. Um, thanks. Uh, uh, welcome. Uh, how do you all? Uh, Today is uh, the uh, meeting just to get you oriented uh, where the location is of the tower. You're probably all familiar with this uh, transfer station, but uh, our site is here. We have Spurwick Avenue, uh, the closest major road, and then Denison Drive, where the transfer station uh, would be here. Public Works is down Cooper Drive. You have the recreational fields at Gullcrest and uh, the remaining open space over here. And this is the backside of Elizabeth Park and Starboard Drive also is uh, over in this area. And then we have the treatment plant. It's relatively nearby. Um, just to get into the location a little bit more, um, we have got a couple of comments that Maureen and uh, Todd Gammon, who's the peer reviewer on the project, have come up with. Uh, so we did update uh, uh, one of this this plan um, that we're showing. And I'm going to that if I could. May have to go back and forth. Um, one of the issues we had uh, before was uh, we were showing a, a telecom cabinet here and that, that should have been a building. Um, so in your next uh, iteration, you're going to see a, pat, uh, a support building here. We have a generator that would support the building. That'll be a, a diesel generator providing emergency power. We have a, a power board here with meters uh, initially, it would just be for the town's uh, use, so there'd only be one meter. Again, it would be public safety, uh, excuse me, public works, police, and fire. Uh, we're also showing some future pads here uh, for any potential uh, co-location. Again, this isn't in your current package, but it will be in your next one. Um, the town doesn't have any plans of doing co-location right now. Uh, it's primarily for public safety. However, they did want to have the opportunity, if that uh, came in the, in the future, to have uh, that, that flexibility. Uh, if you go out there today, there's a gravel area here for parking. There's some trails that uh, go through the area. And then we would be providing an access drive with a turnaround and then a crushed stone compound. And then a three-legged lattice tower, self-supporting tower. And I have a picture that didn't make it into the packet, um, but this is sort of what we're looking at here. Uh, you've got the three legs with three individual supports. Um, you know, a little bit of a close up of what, you know, this is a typical installation. Uh, Mark Davis of Durago Dur uh, Wireless has been helping the, the town. They do all the communications and he provided these pictures as a, an example of, of a, a similar installation. Um, some of the issues that uh, came up um, through Maureen's memo and uh, Todd Gammon's review, uh, we said there were going to be no lights on here. Uh, in actuality, there, there wouldn't be any area lighting per se, but again, we would have some lighting. I'm going to blow this one up because it's really small. This is a, a typical support building and there's a lighting over the man door. And, uh, We've got another photo here that shows another similar installation. And again, there's a light there. So there would be a, a, a light in the, in the uh, for the illumination of the, in the, the uh, support building, but there wouldn't be any area lighting uh, in the building, in the uh, compound area. Uh, another item that came up, I'm gonna go back to the packet, whoops, wrong plan. I'm going to go back into this uh, plan set. Uh, there's a question about signs. Yeah, here we go. Sorry about that. We have three signs located. There's one sign there. There would be a second sign over here, and then we've got a third sign that goes here. Uh, and those signs would be Uh, we'd have a, at the sign one location, authorized personnel only. Uh, to, after this point, that would be uh, probably a 12 by 18 sign. And then these two signs would go on the, the fence itself, a do not enter, access restricted, and then we'll have some sort of an FAA licensure sign as well. 
so those are two items that uh, Maureen had noted as pending um, that we needed to address. Stormwater, uh, essentially this uh, compound area would be a gravel buildup with a crushed stone surface layer. Uh, and that crushed stone, that, that granular material actually acts more as a, a treatment device because the stormwater is gonna wanna go into the, uh, into the stone and um, be detained and any excess uh, runoff from this area in the driveway go through the wooded areas around here. So those uh, act as a low impact development uh, feature. We have less than 10,000 square feet of impervious area, so we don't have to do a formal stormwater uh, permit uh, or stormwater calculation, excuse me. Um, and so that, uh, I believe Todd has looked at that and gone along with that, uh, that uh, approach for dealing with the stormwater. We also have done a noise evaluation for the generator that's in the packet. Um, if we go back to the plan. You can see where this is the uh, 225 foot uh, setback area. We're about 300 feet from Spurwink Avenue. So even um, the generator when you're right next to it is at something like 75 dBA. By the time you get to the uh, Spurwink Avenue, it's less than 40. And then we have a residence that's over 800 feet in this direction. And that's well under the uh, 45 dBA nighttime requirements. So that uh, noise will not be an issue for this uh, project. We've asked for one waiver and that would be the boundary survey of the transfer station uh, that's on, on file. Uh, the the um, other issues that we've been working with, we had SW Cole do a geotechnical report. We've provided that to you folks. It's uh, above and beyond what you might typically have seen in a, a completeness package, but we have that as well. Um, we did share some renderings in the ap application packet. Um, I can run through those quickly. What we did, we uh, did a balloon study. We filled a helium balloon and floated it up to 180 feet and took photographs from various areas. And then from those photographs, we were able to superimpose um, the tower uh, rendering. So this is from the uh, middle school parking lot. Uh, this is the new uh, ramp that you folks approved some time ago. Again, the tower is in the horizon here. Um, this is another spot for a shot from a, a little bit further back in the middle school. This is from uh, over by Elizabeth Park uh, on the Greenbelt Trail towards the high school. Again, in the horizon. This was taken from uh, Route 77 near uh, Fowler Road. We have the high school here and again, the towers in this area. This is taken from Spurwink Avenue. Um, the Gullcrest parking lot is here. Again, the towers in that location. This is over by the Spurwing Cemetery, looking across the marsh. This is actually from the marsh. Um, and that. So then again, we're going to notice it, um, but it's above the horizon, but it doesn't particularly stand out. This is a little bit stealthy. This is taken on Spurwing Avenue with Wainwright uh, Circle here and Spurwing Avenue off to the left. And then this is uh, from the Gulf Crest uh, parking lot. And then this uh, photo here is from the, about where the flagpole uh, used to be on the uh, public works facility. And then this is over by the Spurwink River um, uh, in actually Scarborough looking across. So it, it does rise above the trees, but um, you know, it's, it's further enough away from residences and other uh, points of interest that it doesn't particularly stand out. As the chief mentioned, we do have some uh, coverage maps. I can just quickly show you those. Um, and what uh, we're going to have to figure out how to get these into an exhibit into the next submission, but we did want to share them with you. This is uh, Route 77 looping through Cape Elizabeth. Um, that. 
So the current cell phone, uh, uh, cell coverage, cell tower. And I'm not sure what happened to the color on this. It's not behaving right. Maybe a problem with sharing the screen. Yeah. It, uh, it's not behaving the way it should be. So I'll have to make those uh, make those images clear to you in the next submission. But essentially, there's a tower here as a very localized area here, fairly poor coverage along the coast. And then there's a 30 foot tower that sets back here further. Um, and it's uh, next, it's on the uh, bottle shed at the transfer station. Again, the coverage around it is pretty good, but uh, beyond uh, that area, it's poor. When you look at the new coverage, it, uh, it really covers this area very well there and reaches out to the coast here as well. And we'll get those uh, on that. And I apologize for not being able to show you those. Um, if there's anything else that we needed to go over, I think that's it. Um, Chief Fenton's on the call as well as uh, Public Works Director Jay Reynolds as well. Uh, so if you had any questions specific to their operations, I'm sure they could help you out. Okay, does anybody have any questions? And we're just doing completeness, right? Yes, this is for completeness. Okay, I'm going to open up uh, the meeting to public comment. So if anyone has any comments on the completeness of this application, uh, go ahead and raise your hands. I only see seven attendees none of whom are raising their hands. Okay, in that case, the uh, public comment session is closed. Um, so we definitely wanna have a site plan, a, a site visit, I would say. Other than that, are there any, does anybody have any questions or comments? Let's have, yeah, I got one. Yeah, go ahead. Does this, I don't think it would, but would it have any effect on the towers farther up on Spurbank Ave at all? I mean, they won't interfere with each other? Uh, we're, we're getting, uh, the town's getting assistance from uh, Arrival Wireless, um, Mark Davis. And he's the one that provided the coverage maps. And uh, I believe he'll be providing us a, a, memo, a memo that would state there would be interference with those, those towers. Okay. Peter. I don't have anything on completeness. I think it's a complete. No. Uh, Steve, the, uh, Steve the, the, the towers, are they cabled also? Sorry, could you repeat that, Peter? Are the, are the towers cabled in addition to the lattice structure? No, it's a self-supporting lattice st structure. Um, the there are there are types of towers that are supported by guy wires. Those tend to take up quite a bit of space. Right. Have multiple guy wires from each anchor, and you need three anchors. So in this application, it, it would take a lot of space and be very pronounced uh, in that area. Now that's why I asked the question. So these are 180 foot tower, 180 foot lattice towers with no guy wires whatsoever. Correct. Bill, can I ask a question? Yes. It's um, completeness oriented. Yep. yep. Completeness okay. oriented. Um, there was a question previously about um, uh, why these couldn't be put on other towers. And I don't know, as part of the, the Tower Relay District, it's required to have uh, include in the package sort of the alternative scenario, like uh, should, it, you know, why could it not be put elsewhere sort of, you know, I, I, that, and that's a question is, is that something that needs to be considered as part of completeness or is that just something that should be discussed 
in sort of substantive review? I, it seems to me that's substantive. But I will say something. I don't think the co-location of the um, requirement, it, this is a separate tower overlay district from the Strout and Jordan property off of Wells. So I don't even think that that would actually apply um, in this type of situation. Yeah, so I think we have enough information to launch into a discussion of that if we Would you need like a motion to. on completeness. Yeah, it's just getting there. Yes, please. <laughs> you ready? Then I have a motion for completeness. You may. Please. Be in order that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review of a 180 foot public safety telecommunication tower be, to be located at 8 Denison Drive be deemed complete. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Discussion, comment, seeing none. Maureen, can you take a full call vote, please? Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. I'm refusing to vote. I want to talk about completeness more. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's a lot. Yes. Okay, motion passes. The application has been deemed complete. Um, so, do you, let's, do you, let's uh, ask that uh, co-location question again and try to put it to rest. I thought they addressed it in the workshop, but hey, that's I kind of <laughs> thought so too, but it's come up. So I don't think there's any requirement that they, co they show that they can't co-locate somewhere else. As I recall, that was the upshot of the meeting. Maureen, do you concur with that? Um, you know, we want to try to be careful that uh, there aren't a large proliferation of towers throughout the town um, because they don't have to show that there isn't a need. And so I think this applicant should be able to show that they have a compelling need to put up a new tower. And I would suggest okay. they've, they've described that. And I mean, the co-location is kind of, it's kind of like in three pieces. One is, do we need a tower? And, and you know, is there other places you can locate to meet your needs? And then the third one is, if you're putting up your own tower, are you planning for it to have space for other people to locate on your tower if they want to? So, I think the applicant can answer those questions. And they can add a narrative to their submission. Yeah, yeah cause I, those questions, you're right, Carolyn. They, they did answer them in the workshop pretty well. But it's not on record though. It would be better. Yeah, no, I know we need a narrative. That's what Maureen's saying, which I agree with. Okay. Well, maybe you could ask the applicant if they're comfortable being able to provide that for the next meeting. I would uh, speak to the applicant. Uh, obviously, uh, the fire chief and the police chief can speak a little more eloquently about um, the need for it, but we would definitely be able to give you a narrative on that that topic. Okay. And and we also, with the uh, added spaces that we're showing or the future pads, we're certainly you know not looking to co-locate, but if something were to come along that wanted to co-locate, the town would certainly entertain that. Okay. Uh, anything else? You had a you you had a drawing in there that showed like every tree species out there. Yeah. What was that for? So there's a there's a provision in the site plan approval that we need to show every tree that has a greater than eight inch diameter at the Rest height, and that's what we've done here. And this is this is essentially the area that we ground surveyed, and then we supplemented that with lidar topography um, that, that you can get uh, from a GIS based 
areas. So it provides the entire coverage of the uh, graphic map, which is more in here. So there will be there will be trees that will it's this, this is essentially the existing conditions plan. This is what's there now. And the the uh, bottle building and the other transfer station building here, parking lot area, the, the trails that go through here. And we did uh, show this trail being rerouted through this area around the, the tower compound. Okay. And can the parking still exist there? What was that, Joe? The parking still? Oh, I'm sorry. Can the parking still exist there? Yeah. Yeah. With this, we're showing the roadway going in like this, but this gravel area will still be out there. Um, people will still be able to park there. Um, probably have to dedicate a, a drive area in case, you know, there was an emergency and we had to get there, but um, it's not anticipated to block this off at all. I wonder if you would need to stripe it or something just to make sure that that road's clear. Yeah, we can think of maybe some options and nothing's popping up that, you know, if we stripe it, it's gravel. So that's not going to last very long. Um, mm. We could come up with some options. But, uh, some sort of no parking throughway type thing. Could you put some sort of buffering, natural buffering, just to designate the parking area versus the drive? Try. Um, this is a 12, 12 feet wide here, so this is you know, 30 feet or so, you know, this area. I'm not sure how well that would, would work in that, that gravel area, though. I was thinking of maintenance and keeping access. It's a good thing to look at when we did the site walk, just to think about yeah. it. Yeah, that would probably be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. I've been, I've been trying to remember. I believe it was the town manager who gave the synopsis of, of, um, using a new tower in lieu of, of uh, siting on somebody else's tower kind of thing. So I just throw that out because they might- Using might what? I believe it was the town manager who, uh, who, who explained why they were looking to do their own tower. And I'm just throwing that out. They well, might okay. want to go to him to get his, uh, maybe he'd write up his explanation. Was, yeah, he's very, he's very well versed in that, Carolyn. And we'll definitely yeah. be reaching out to him. Um, okay, anything else? Well, I think I'm... All right, why don't let's come up with a uh, time for a site walk here. Sometime next week? Yeah. Let's see. I can't do Wednesday or Thursday. Who can okay. do Tuesday? Mm, Tuesday is good. Tuesday I could do five. Tuesday at five. Fifteen. <laughs> is it still light at five fifteen? Well, I'm still working at five, so oh. <laughs> sunset's I, like a little before six. So five fifteen, it should still be okay. All right, yeah. Tuesday five fifteen. Sure. Any nays? All right. Tuesday at five fifteen. You want to check with the applicant? I'm I'm fine with that. I, I'm assuming the chief would be, but I'll let them weigh in if they want. Um, Works for me. 
I'm fine with it, Steve. Okay, so Tuesday the 27th at 5.15, and we'll meet at the uh, parking lot right there. All right, so if there's no uh, further discussion, Steve, you feel you know what to do, right? Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I know it's been a long night. And appreciate Did you it. like a tabling motion? Yeah, I, yes. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. I can read your mind. <laughs> Go ahead. Please. I'm ready. Okay. Steve, can you be the host, Maureen? Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for a site plan review of the 180 foot public safety telecommunication towers to be located at 8 Denison Drive be tabled to the regular November 17, 2020 meeting of the planning board at which time a public hearing will be held. Do I have a second? Second. Maureen. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Mr. Jim. Hill. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Starbeck. Yes. Here, Shalott. Yes. Okay, the motion passed. It's unanimous. Thank you, gentlemen. Maureen, you the host. See you Tuesday. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Next item Woodland Senior Living of Cape Elizabeth LLC is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan for Cape Memory Care located at 126 Scott Dyer Road to install a 17 and three quarter by 5.7 foot air handling unit on a 22 foot high steel support structure. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19.9 site plan regulations. So we'll begin by having the applicant uh, summarize the project. Uh, and I'm guessing that's John Barrett who will be speaking. Um, John, do you want to uh, unmute your microphone there? Uh, my name's Elliot Thayer. I'm oh, sorry. Here. I'm here with John Barrett this okay. evening. Um, I'm the engineer on the project, Thayer Engineering. And at the last meeting on September 1st, um, we went over the site plan that I've prepared at um, 126 Scott Dyer Road. And this application is for a proposed air handler on the west side of the building. Um, and it's really within, uh, Maureen, excuse, go ahead. You want oh. to put up the site plan or do you want to do it? Oh, could you do that, Maureen? Thank I'm you. I'm happy to do that for you. Yes, thank you. Um, so the Scott diode is to the north on the top of this sheet. Um, Willow Brook is the westerly property line on the left hand side of the sheet and superimposed onto this site plan that actually I have prepared during the initial permitting back in 2010, um, I just superimposed this proposed air handler on the west side of the building about halfway back. 
and it, it actually sits in the corner, you can see, of the existing building. So it doesn't really extend outside of the, what would be like the outside footprint of the building. Um, it's gonna be on a concrete pad, a base, and then there'll be a steel structure that's 22 feet high going up the side of the building um, with a footprint of six feet by 18 feet high. And then the air handling unit itself will sit on top of that steel structure that's seven feet high. So the total height is going to be slightly less than 29 feet. Um, this elevation that we're looking at isn't quite to scale. The, the roof of the building is actually close to 35 feet high. So this will be well below the top of the existing roof. Um, we, went, we went through um, the site plan. Um, this is to replace dated HVAC equipment. Um, so this is a, a new air handling unit. Um, you've got information that were, was prepared by our well, Woodlands mechanical engineer um, requested um, by Maureen and the board, um, both on sound and then that elevation we're looking at. And then there's also an air handle of plan view. Um, we, the question came up at the last meeting about sound, um, and this is on the site plan. This unit will be slightly over 80 feet from the property line at Willow Brook, and there are large trees on the property just on the east side of Willow Brook. Um, the next residence to the west um, is also buffered by large trees on its property. And the house we've just scaled on Google Earth from this air handler unit is about 400 feet to the west, uh, west northwest. Um, so there's a significant distance and also significant vegetation between the air handle unit and the closest house. Um, we'll, we can review and answer any questions that the board may have. Um, this seems um, kind of unobtrusive, as I said, within the overall building footprint and also lower than the existing height of the building. So we're available to answer any questions. Okay. Um, so go ahead, Jim. You had your hand up. Why didn't you put it on the ground? Why did you put it on this big structure? Um, John Barrett's going to step in and answer that. Hi. Good evening. Uh, it's due to where the ductwork um, is in the attic that it has to hook into. Um, the only location we can make this work is by on a metal stand um, and connecting to the existing ductwork. Otherwise, we would be interior of the building, tearing down three quarters of the sheetrock to make any other unit work. I mean, you couldn't duct it straight up and then into the gable end? Uh, Jim, we are looking at completeness. Okay, here. you're right. You're right, you're right. No, we cannot you're right. answer the question, we can't. Okay, yeah, just a reminder to everybody, we're judging this for completeness before we go into substantive issues. Um, so does any, did you- I have a question uh, for Marie. Yeah, go ahead. There's no engineer's letter. Is it me or did I lose it or? What? No, we. We, we didn't do an engineer's letter because um, we just didn't see anything that the engineer would review. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. <laughs> um, uh, 
any other i have yeah. a question wait i do have a question um the you the uh unit that you're putting up there uh do you know what the unit is yet yeah and we submitted the documentation you did did it have any information on the uh acoustics on, on what kind of noise it generates yeah we submitted that oh i see it okay um i will okay. say that we have existing Good. outdoor units um, on the same side of the building um, that also produce noise that have been there since we opened okay all right let's get a motion here i got okay. a motion for you okay go for it who's who's got who's who's getting the luck you do it okay yeah. Motion for completeness, be it, uh, yeah. Motion for completeness, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Woodland Senior Living of Cape Elizabeth LLC for an amendment to the previously approved site plan for Cape Memory Care located at 126 Scott Dyer Road to install the 17.75 by 5.7 foot air handling unit on a 22 foot high steel support structure be deemed complete. Second. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Maureen? Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Huebner? Yes. Ms. Gordon? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Mr. Shalott? Yes. Motion passes. Application is deemed complete. Okay. Um, does anybody feel we need a site visit for this? Okay, great. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, Maureen. I don't think anyone was interested, but did you oh, open up for public yeah, comment? Yes, sorry. Okay, we're going to open up the meeting to public uh, hearing. Public comment. Public comment, thank you, on the issue of completeness. I can't see my participant screen. Right there, there. there are five attendees and no one oh, there has we go. their hand. Okay, yep, no one has their hand up. Okay, public comment session is closed. Um, does anybody have any other comments or, Jim, you wanna ask your question again about going through, are you satisfied that the unit needs to be at the top rather than at the bottom? Um, just for a minute, I mean, seems like an expensive way to do it, but if that's what they think is best, um, who am I to say? Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, Joe, this is Dan. I, yeah. I, I just want to, oh, go ahead, Jim. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's, I, I'm sure they looked at it. I, you know, having done many of these, um, I would run a duck straight up the building and then in, but I'm not there standing, looking at the building and might be obvious why we can't do that, but yeah. I don't know. So Dan, you had a comment? Yeah, uh, just a, a, a comment. I, I think um, it was John that was talking a little bit about acoustics and the closest um, receptor. And I don't see houses on the site plan. And I think he said 450 feet. It might be good uh, to show those. I Unless I'm looking at the wrong plan here. Um, I think they have, they don't have it there, Dan, but they do have the land, um, the Whitaker property. Right. The that's Whitaker. listed. Right, right. I don't know. I'm just, just a, a, a comment or a question. Um, uh, do we, you know, typically show, show that, that residence when, because that's the issue. Maureen, you know, hold on. Maureen. Just to, to address Dan's concern. I understand that applicants like to talk about the closest resident, but the standard is the measurement from the property line. And so you, you need to meet the noise requirement at the property line. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. You're very welcome. And so it looks like we are meeting the standard at the property line. Okay, more uh, Carol Ann. If I remember correctly, in my from my reading, they've done some additional 
mitigation, noise mitigation within the... They put some ducted, uh, they lined some duct work to take the sound down is what it looked like. So I, I read that correctly, even though I'm not an engineer. There you go, <laughs> you're hired. Yeah, so the, the uh, sound calculates at 40, 41, or 42 from the various uh, individual um, parts of this thing. Now, do you have, a, is this, if, if these are all running together, does that increase the sound? No. I guess that would. No, that is the total sound that the machine or equipment produces. Yeah. And it's running. Yeah, they're not additive, Joe, when you're, you got two different power sources. They don't, you don't add one on top of the other since they're logarithmic. Oh, okay. Well, so you, you this is Andrew, you, you put a combined estimate of 46.9 dBA in your documentation. So, I mean, in theory, that is above it, but basically you're saying you will, you're going to reduce, and I'm trying to understand this, the fan speeds at night to get below the 45. Is that the idea? Yeah, it's variable speed. It, that's, calculated at 100% that it was running at 100%, which it would never happen. But we're also, uh, we're as we submitted, are, are willing to add um, different items to reduce the sound that it produces. Um, so I guess in some cases we've had We've asked for uh, an applicant to provide a test at the property line once the installation has taken place to verify that the decibel level's been reached. And I think that's pretty easy to do now. So we could put that, we could add that in as a condition. Yeah, essentially the you know the manufacturer is 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 doing these tests and readings in a controlled environment where sure. the unit's going to be sitting outside, so uh, you know it's understandable that it's hard to get until it's in place to get an actual decibel level is nearly impossible. So, Joe, you want to add a condition for post installation? I think it would be good just to test it out. I mean, my guess is that with all the trees that it's going to be lower. We have a similar unit at a different location. And I understand it, it means nothing, but, um, you know, we installed that unit on the rooftop um, without any issue. Um, from the ground, you cannot hear it running. We haven't had any complaints of neighbors and the neighbors are closer, the property lines are closer. But uh, again, I understand those different circumstances. But I'm confident that a noise level will not be an issue. Like I said, there's already existing outdoor units that are, you know, are producing noise on the same side. Um. Anything else? It appears we're not going to table this based on what we have here. We're just going to go to a, approval. I would say, I don't see, do you, we don't feel we need a site visit. Maureen, is there any reason we can't? No, there's no reason you can't move ahead if you're comfortable. I, the only thing, uh, I mean, I would want to see some provision for testing the decibel level at the property line. That's it. Doesn't have to be, I don't know what we've accepted before in the past. If somebody just goes out with the app on their iPhone and tests it. Yep. I think that's fine. 
you you could make a, a requirement that you know after installation that the decibel level needs to be tested at the property line and if it exceeds 45 decibels they have to return to the planning board okay you want me to start in yes Motion for approval, findings of fact. Woodland Senior Living of Cape Elizabeth LLC is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan for Cape Memory Care located at 126 Scott Dyer Road to install a 17.75 by 5.7 foot air handling unit on a 22 foot high steel support structure, which requires review under section 19-9 site plan regulations. Two, Cape Memory care has been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with site plan regulations and the findings and decisions of the prior approval which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. Three, the amendment reflects the actual capabilities of the site to support development. Four, the amendment will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion plan submitted with the original site plan approval. Five, the develop well well, we don't know, but we the development will not substantially increase noise levels and cause human discomfort. Six, the ap uh, application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Um, and seven, the applicant will measure the sound level at the property line uh, upon completion of the project. Um, if the Isn't sound that a condition of approval? Yes. That's a condition of approval, not a finding of fact. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Okay. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Woodland Senior Living and Cape Elizabeth LLC for an amendment to the previously approved site plan for Cape Memory Care located at 126 Scott Dye Road to install a 17.75 by 5.7 foot air handling unit on a 22 foot high steel support structure be approved subject to the following condition. One, that the erosion control measures included in the, in the original site plan approval be applied during the construction of the air handling unit. Two, that the applicant will measure the sound level at the property line upon completion of the project. If the sound exceeds the 45 DBA uh, level required by the town, uh, the applicant will come back before the planning board with uh, mitigation measure, proposed mitigation number, uh, a proposed mitigation. Yeah. That sounds good. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? No, good. Maureen. <laughs> uh, go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Curry. <laughs> yes. Was that a yes? Yes. Okay. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Huebner. Yes. Ms. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Mr. Shalott. Yes. Mr. Bedensky. All right. Sorry. The motion passes. Thank you very much. All right. Show the gas. <laughs> All right, we should have uh, Julia Frederick coming on board for this. Next item, <clears throat> David Smith is requesting an amendment to the previously approved private road approval for a portion of Cunner Lane to reduce the right of way width from 70 feet, seven inches to 50 feet. The application under consideration for completion is under consideration for completion and a public hearing, hearing has been scheduled for this evening. The plan will be reviewed under section 1623 of the subdivision ordinance. Uh, so let's begin with uh, Julia, you can go ahead and uh, are you going to show your, um, do you want to show your plans or do you want Maureen to do it? 
Uh, I'll show my plans through my screen. Okay. Is there anyone else that should be joining you? No. Okay. They've all gone to bed. <laughs> Can everyone see my screen? Oh, no. Nope. nope. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me one moment here while I share my screen. Okay, uh, so I am Julia Frederick, a landscape architect with Mitchell and Associates. And I am representing the owner applicant, David Smith. Our application requests to amend a previously approved private right of way uh, to reduce a portion of the width to the standard 50 foot width. Right now it's, it's a little bit over 70 feet wide. Um, so, this is the existing condition in this plan you see right here uh, with a 73, seven inches width. And our proposal here actually reduces a portion of the width down to the standard 50 foot uh, with the purpose of expanding the building envelope in lot 26-1 and both of the lots in question are owned by Mr. Smith. Um, and when we reduce a portion of the private roadway, um, right away width, it will shift the property lines slightly. Oh, also, in addition, there was a, uh, in the existing condition, we have a, a turn, a very small turnaround easement up here in the driveway of, of lot 26-1, and we will have to just extend it to meet the, the proposed uh, slightly narrower right of way. Also, we have uh, reviewed and approved or uh, accept uh, the planning memo as well as the, the reviewing engineer's comments. So in our final plan submittal, we will add uh, the location of the corner points of the proposed right of way um, per the memo that Steve Harding put out. Any questions from the board? Nope, seems straightforward. Um, okay, so we're gonna begin with completeness. Uh, does anybody have any issue with the completeness of this? Okay. Uh, and so this, we're gonna have a, the public hearing is for I'm um, asking you, Maureen. Public hearing is if after we deem it complete. Right. Correct? We okay. Could open up a public comment period yep. on this, and there is an attendee who has her hand up. Okay. So we're going to open the uh, and, and discussion. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Julia, either you're going to have to let them speak or you're going to have to give me back hosting duties. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see. I will give you the hosting duties. One moment, please. All right. On, on your mark, sir. All right. <laughs> we are going to open the meeting to public comment on the question of completeness of the application. And this is a discussion of whether the application is complete to consider all the substantive issues that might be underlying the uh, application. So I see a hand up, Sherry Stewart. Uh, you can go ahead and address the issue of completeness. That hand is now down. Okay. So seeing no other hands up, the public comment period is closed. 
and um, planning board members. I have a motion. Okay, please make it. Motion for completeness, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted in the facts presented, the application of David Smith for an amendment to the previously approved private road approval for a portion of Cunner Lane be to reduce the right of way width from 70 feet, seven inches to 50 feet be deemed complete. Second. Okay. Jim got it. Okay. <laughs> Maureen, oh wait, any comments? No, okay, we get good, comment? Maureen, yeah. roll call. I gave you a few more seconds this time. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bradensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Huebner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Mr. Shalott. Yes, motion passes. Okay, um, so, Let's begin our substantive discussion. Uh, do you want to hand the uh, posting back to Julia so we can get the plan back up, please? Certainly. You are going to have to hold an actual public hearing, too. Yes. You want to do that right now so that. OK, good. Uh, so the meeting now will be opened up to a public hearing. And so if you have any uh, comment on any portion of the application. Um, now is the time to make it. So I'm looking over at my attendee screen. I do not see any hands up. And oh, there's one. Okay, Sherry Stewart. You can go ahead and let her speak. And uh, I'm trying to unmute. Am I unmuted? Yep, you are unmuted. Thank we you. can hear you. I'm going to, you know, pass it on to my husband, Jack. So okay. he has a question. Uh, concerned that I understand correctly, this is about Cunner Lane or Cunner Drive being widened or been thinned or, or narrowed. Cunner That's Lane. Is your, that right? so your question is it's about the right of way. No, it's not affecting Cunner Lane. Mr. Stewart, do you have an address you can give me? Uh, 421 Queensway Drive, Lexington, Kentucky, 40502. Thank you. Um, no, the modifications, I believe, are all within the property. Which is 20, 26, unit 26, lot 26. Yes, lot 26 and 26 one. Um, the private right of way is off of Cunner Lane. Correct. So Cunner Lane won't change. Is that correct? The physical this is not of any portion of Cunner Lane is going to be exactly the same, and it's not a portion of Cunner Lane that other people are using. It's the portion of Cunner Lane after you drive through the, the stone pillars, and it only affects the two lots that are owned by Mr. Smith. Okay, That's okay. which is yes. Okay, it's, uh, an, it's an effort to give him more opportunity to do what they want to do. Is that right? This is an application to modify the right of way on between two lots that he owns both of. There's nothing to do with anything. It has nothing to do that. with nothing, nothing to do with Brick Road. Correct. It does not affect our access to or from Brick Road. No. Okay. No. Nope. That's all we want to know. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate the opportunity though to be involved in this and your notices and we're very interested in this neighborhood and, and look forward to hearing everything else. Great, well, thank you very much. Uh, anybody else wishing to make a comment? Seeing none, the public comment period is closed.
And now can you return the host to Julia and go ahead and put your uh, plan back up? Meanwhile, you're all thinking of questions, right? <laughs> okay. Here we go. Here is the pro uh, proposed site plan. Okay. Um, oh yeah, there we go. All right. So Carol Ann, you have a question. I do. And I just am, am not understanding something that she stated earlier. Um, the turnaround, you you said something about needing to extend the turnaround. Is oh, I... um, yes, it's a turnaround easement. Yep. And in the existing condition, I just flipped back to the existing conditions plan, the easement is just this little triangle here but on the proposed plan we have to extend this turnaround easement just to capture uh, this space to connect to the right of way so that the turnaround easement um, abuts the right of way. so so it's rewriting the easement so it's clear is that yep. what okay so it's the exact same turnaround yeah it, okay. it just extends the easement yep all right all right, I understand now. And you went around, you have 20 feet around the side of the cistern there? That is correct. That was per uh, Steve Harding and the fire chief's uh, request. Okay. All right, I got nothing else. Got me either. Maureen, you got anything? Not a thing. <laughs> All right. In that case, let's get a motion here. Not anything. You're on a roll. Should I call on somebody? Someone else needs a turn, right? Yeah. 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 I lost my voice. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. It, it isn't that long. OK. <laughs> Findings of fact, David Smith is requesting amendment to the previously approved private road approval for a portion of Cunner Lane to reduce the right of way width from 70 feet, seven inches to 50 feet, which requires review under section 16-2-3 of the subdivision ordinance. Second, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the portion of Cunner Lane has been previously approved by Cape Elizabeth Planning Board as a private road in compliance with the subdivision regulations and the findings and decisions of the prior approval, which are not altered by this proposed amendment, the proposed amendments remain in effect. All lots are provided with vehicular access and construction is designed to meet town standards. The applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance section 16-3-1. Therefore, be it ordered that based on plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of David Smith for an amendment to the previously approved private road approval for a portion of Cunner Lane to reduce the right of way width from 70 feet, seven inches to 50 feet be approved subject to the following conditions that the plans be revised to address the recommendation in the town engineer's letter dated October 13, 2020, and that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording the subdivision plan. Second. Second. Anybody wait? <laughs> Peter did Thank it. You. Peter, okay. Discussion? Good. Um, Maureen, vote please. First alphabetical order? Any order. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. And Mr. Podensky? Yes.
Uh, you missed one. And share Shalom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Julia. Okay, thank you, everyone. Good night. Think, did you give yeah. the hosting back to Maureen? Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. I do have a question before the board adjourns. Okay. Well, I have many, but I'm only going to ask one. So um, the short-term rental draft, do you want it on your November workshop? You don't need to. It's it's up to you. I, I would suggest we get it to the council as soon as possible. Right. Why do we need to see it again? Well, you've tabled it to the November 17th meeting when you're holding a public hearing. So okay. if you wanted to talk about it again, you would not be holding it up. But if you're satisfied with the draft you receive, there's no reason to put it on the workshop. I'm satisfied. The draft we satisfied. received was reviewed, right? The draft you received, you I mean, you you got it for this meeting. Yes. It includes the things you discussed at your last special workshop. So for example, if there are things that I drafted that I didn't get done correctly, according to your intentions, the workshop would be a good opportunity to fix it. If there are things I drafted the way you thought you wanted it, but you looked at it and had second thoughts, that would be another opportunity at the workshop to deal with it. But you're not obligated to discuss it again. It's going to public hearing November 17th. And I heard nothing tonight that would lead me to want to review it from the public comment that we heard tonight. That's just me though. Yeah. I'm what if I see something between now and then, I just want to bring it up uh in the workshop i don't plan on it but if i see something well if you see something say something jim <laughs> <laughs> well the way we could leave it is the the workshop agenda the workshop is supposed to be november 4th so the submission deadline is october 27th if any member of the planning board wanted to send an email saying, hey, I see something I want to discuss. And it came by November, by October 27th. I could, the chair could decide to put it on the agenda. Do we need to be specific or like, if could we say, if we say we want to discuss it, can we discuss anything in it or do we? Yes, if, if you say you want to discuss it, I would encourage you to not narrow what you're going to discuss. Okay. Frankly, when you get together, you're going to talk about anything anyway. Yeah, I, I think the only open points were the addendum that Maureen drafted, talking about some of the considerations that were going to be put out as our ideas, but not our recommendation. And I thought they were pretty good, personal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I went through them. I don't have any, I couldn't find anything I'd want to change, but. Is there, right, well, we have till October 27th. I mean, is there a downside to putting it on the agenda? And then Joe says, does anyone have anything to say? And if everybody says no, then move the, on. Well, I think the only, the only downside is people seem to be incredibly sensitized right now. Yeah. So if you're going to put it on the agenda and then not talk about it, there, you know, there may be some sense that yeah. you know, something that was less than fully disclosed is happening. No, I like the idea of the 27th. So I'm, if I see something, I'll let you know by then. Yeah, so whoever says I want to discuss something has to come in with something to discuss. Yeah, OK. OK. Sounds good. Um, anything else? I'm sorry there are so many items on this agenda. It was. A difficult agenda to put out. I would suggest you through it. I we got through it. Like Nobody to hear that to you again. <laughs> I was okay. with, it, with the next okay, one. Yeah. Is there anything at the next meeting other than the short-term rental? At the next full meeting, there will be. There will be. There. I believe the uh, the proposal from the carries for the extra extra lot on Alexander Drive, which is going to be called Magnolia Terrace will be on that agenda. Um, it's up to the chair, but I, I think he sort of told me that the short-term rentals will be the beginning of the meeting. I said that. <laughs> You're going to. 
<laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Maybe I was just interpreting what you did for this month's meeting. Yeah, yeah. there are a couple a couple of things from tonight that are going the power goes to public hearing. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And just Maybe. a reminder that the workshop is on Wednesday night. Is there anything for the workshop, Maureen? Um I think there is something. Hold on, I thought I had it. And don't forget to vote. I voted. Already Already Car done. Carol Ann, do you guys have more than two machines this time? Can you bulge that? I can tell you, I believe this is public information. They have had over 5,000 requests for absentee ballots. In Cape Elizabeth? Town. In the town of wow. Cape Elizabeth. That's wow. more than half. <laughs> So yeah, that is more you know than what I'm doing next week. Absentee ballots. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love Do the you new need box. help at the polls in any way. I'm sorry. Sorry. Do you need you help need to at talk the to polls? Chevy Lane about that? Oh, okay. Can you? Can you can can really really lined up. There's What's nothing it? on the workshop agenda yet. Hmm. Wow. So if there's nothing on the workshop agenda, then it might not be a workshop. That is true. Unless somebody comes up with something by the 27th. <laughs> That's right. That will affect my decision. <laughs> <laughs> no, won't you? No, won't you? <laughs> Your due diligence like you always do. All right, all right. Yeah. All right. Um, how about a, a motion here? Motion, we adjourn. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha, Jim. <laughs> All right, Maureen, take a roll call vote, please. And I'm going to go, you know, the way I've actually been able to do it right. Mr. Podensky. <laughs> yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. I will vote when Maureen tells us if she's sleeping in her office tonight. I am not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Chair Shalot. Yes. Glennis is still, is still uh, on our participants list. She's, She's just monitoring when her mom's going to come home. This is our call. Glennis down the party at the house. Exactly. So can I say All right, guys. Stay adjourned. Okay. Everyone go home. <laughs> All right, folks. The meeting is adjourned. See you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.